what the uh, Brelvis have said that Qasim Ranotwi has denied penalty prophethood. Mm-hmm. He did deny, deny it, <laughs> right? Oh, and then this Dobandi said that Ahmad Raza Khan he denied something as well. He did deny it. <laughs> so you both become deviant. So now you've wiped out the ulama class because they kind of refute each other, cancel each other out. So this is on uh, womanhood. So this is Mustafa Sabri's scathing critique of uh, Western uh, understanding of womanhood or of feminism. Okay. And he doesn't hold back. So he's very like, and, and he kind of defends the traditional uh, Islamic understanding of not just um, about a woman's role in society by regarding free mixing uh, and other such uh, things that come up. So he does like a scathing critique of uh, Western um, uh, understanding of womanhood and how is uh, in their uh, supposed desire to free the woman. If, for example, a mujtahid like Ibn Hazm, in his view, he thinks that Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik or one of these other Imams gets it really badly wrong, mm-hmm. right? And they must be ignorant and he's very passionate about this and he's uttered such language, right? A mujtahid or a great scholar. That doesn't give us the right to go and utter that same language about that Imam. Mm-hmm. There is this kind of notion when you're living in countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, and you look at the West, you think, look, there's no, uh, you know, um, uh, abuse towards women. Look, they can walk around free. No one does anything. Uh, only when the Mewtwo comes out is that these same very progressive institutions were hotbeds for abuse, mm-hmm. which when we look back at it, it makes complete sense, mm-hmm. right? When you look at the MeToo movement, uh, where women were saying that in these, uh, you know, very progressive institutions, we were abused. Uh, and when you look, we say, of course they were abused. Yeah. Look at the setup. Yeah. Right? I'm going to use those arguments against each other and nullify all of them. <laughs> so basically, if I accuse you of something, you accuse me of something, a cameraman comes and says, you know what, you're both right, you're both deviant. <laughs> and then this kind of culminates into even uh, his views regarding Sahaba, mm-hmm. very negative views where Sahaba like Muawiyah, Sufyan, or the, Anhu, the language he's used is, you know, horrendous, right? Mm. Right, that uh, everyone can be united, just follow me. And we saw what Malik said, Yeah. right? If Malik didn't feel that he was competent enough for the Ummah to be united behind, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> exactly. Right, Imam Malik is saying, "Don't use my muatta, yeah. right, for everyone to get behind." But then this guy feels confident with the engineering degree to come along and say that I'm going to unite the ummah because of my Quran and Sunnah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salawatu wa salam ala nabiyyi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome viewers to episode 10 of the Islamic Book Review Podcast with myself, Muhammad Ladat, and our esteemed uh, scholar, Maulana Dr. Zishan. Today we'll be discussing uh, a couple of topics and um, a few books. Before we get into the main crux of the podcast uh, to do with instances of ignorance, we want to begin first with a brief overview of a recent publication uh, a book called Al Qawl fil Mar'a, my statement or the statement regarding the woman, which is a book in that discusses uh, issues and topics in Islam surrounding women uh, and answering objections surrounding women's issues or women's topics in Islam. Now, I'll hand over to Maulana Zishan to kind of give us a brief overview of this book before we move on. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmaduhu wa sallim wa nusallim ala rasulihi al-kareem. Amma ba'id. So, um, we're going to be doing a few things as you mentioned. So the first thing we're looking at uh, today is um, a newly published book. Or the book is older, of course, right? But the book is uh, first is a translation of Mustafa Sabri's, uh, rahimahullah's book, Qawli fil Mar'a. In English, it's translated as views on, uh, Mustafa Sabri Effendi's views on womanhood. That's okay. how they translate the, 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 the title. And this is translated by uh, Ustad. Uh, Muzammil Al-Nadwi and Ustad Junaid Gharir. Uh, I'm not aware of the second Ustad, Ustad Junaid, but I'm, um, uh, I know uh, Ustad Muzammil uh, Al-Nadwi quite well. And actually I was sent a, a draft copy of this just to kind of read through, to do like a proofreading of it. And I thought it was very important that um, you just kind of uh, highlight uh, the importance of this book. Um, and just give some brief background to it and just maybe read from a couple of places and then what we'll do inshallah is on the um, description of the 
uh, of the video, I'll put a link of where you can purchase the book. It's well worth a, a purchase, and I'll tell you what was happening here, inshallah. So uh, Mustafa Sabri, uh, rahimahullah, was one of the, first, the last great Ottoman scholars uh, who was a... Um, now there is more of an, uh, uh, a... Um, uh, an interest. Yes, yeah, so there's an interest regarding Mustafa Sabri because of the whole interest in... Ottoman history mm -hmm. that has increased. So we spoke about this before as well, where uh, there's much more of a uh, interest amongst people to talk about Ottoman history, Ottoman scholarship, everything Ottoman. Mm -hmm. So in that, um, <coughs> within that uh, interest, there's been a focus on some of the books of Mustafa Sabri. So even in Arabic, there's been um, newer editions of his book, uh, probably most famous for his uh, book on um, uh, uh, Ilm, which is his uh, discussion, his it's what they call magnus opus where he talks about uh knowledge philosophy um and, and uh, how to kind of make sense of that within the tradition kalami schools mm -hmm. uh the ash'adi school the matidi school so he uh, is a um, imam and that's what he's no usually known for uh, what he's kind of more lesser known for at least amongst our circles is his uh, views on uh, fiqh and social issues mm -hmm. uh, and so he did write about those topics so he's got a book on um on womanhood, he's got a book on Tarjamatul Quran, which mm -hmm. is a very popular uh, work. But one of the issues with the books of Mustafa Sabri is that, uh, so when I read Qawli Fil Mar'a, or when I, in Arabic, and when I read uh, Tarjamatul Quran, one of the things that you kind of struggle with as a reader is that he's kind of making references to journalists, figures at his time mm -hmm. uh, that, um, you know, we would not necessarily be aware of, or we were kind of referencing a, a, a magazine or a newspaper. <laughs> and we won't be aware of what they're talking about. So it becomes quite a difficult read. And we so, wouldn't have access to them because they'll be in Ottoman Turkish. No, no, even if it's Arabic. Okay. It's just stuff that you're not reading. If it's like okay. a 1920s um, newspaper article, yeah. whether it's in Arabic or it's in English, right? We're not going to necessarily be aware of those figures okay, yeah. that he's talking about. So uh, it does make the book, even the Arabic, if you know Arabic, mm. quite a difficult read to kind of uh, navigate through that. What uh, these brothers have done, uh, these scholars have done is... Um, They've translated the work. This is on uh, womanhood. So this is Mustafa Sabri's scathing critique of uh, Western uh, understanding of womanhood or of feminism. Okay. And he doesn't hold back. So he's very like, and, and he kind of defends the traditional uh, Islamic understanding of not just um, about a woman's role in society, but regarding free mixing uh, and other such uh, things that come up. So he does like a scathing critique of uh, Western um uh, understanding of womanhood and how is uh, in their uh, supposed desire to free the woman, how it actually has a much more of a, a negative impact. And what's <coughs> quite very interesting, and when I spoke to the uh, the translator, Ustad Muzammil, about this, and um, he was sharing the same thing, that even you read it, <coughs> it seems like he's talking about today, even mm. though it was written 100 years ago. So it really much seems like it's, it's very relevant. So he lived basically... Uh, near the end of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, and not post uh, for the Ottoman uh -huh. Empire. So okay. now this book is um, has a, uh, a biography of Mustafa Sabri, mm -hmm. right? He has a foreword by Sheikh Wail al Hambali, who's actually published the uh, uh, republished the uh, Arabic of the yep. book. Uh, and then um, what they've done, the translators, is that they have made the difficulty of uh, the Arabic when you're not aware of who he's referring to. They've made very useful footnotes in explaining the background to the debate, the discussion who he's talking about, the person's view that he's refuting. So he's actually made the book as far more of a uh, easier book to navigate through. Yeah. So it's very pertinent with the current discussions of femininity, <coughs> discussions of masculinity, um, the discussion of... Um, what is a woman? Well, I don't think he thought that far ahead, right? <laughs> but maybe he did kind of uh, think through that. But the idea is that uh, gender interaction, which mm -hmm. is a common debate, right? That uh, what should be the interaction between uh, genders? So we're talking about there's of course a internal discussion amongst Muslims of uh, what is suitable, what is not suitable, and then you have of course uh, amongst non-Muslim circles where we can all agree it's uh, not uh, it's not suitable. So how do you critique that? What's the problems with that? So most of us subway provides a very good. Um, uh, critique of that So I'll, I'll, I'll read a couple of sections And we just kind of end it on that mm -hmm. Because it's not a full review mm -hmm. I would advise people to uh, purchase a copy So I've just got like a couple of uh, places I've highlighted here That I'm going to read through uh, Translation is very nice uh, It's very readable So he says on the, top, on the chapter of uh, Unveiling and veiling He says There is no dispute That the Near East Is the cradle of civilization knowledge 
This is because it is a homeland of prophets and the place where divine revelation was set down. Even the Greek civilizations, which is the oldest in Europe and that by, uh, and that by which the West was illuminated before its illumination with the knowledge of Islam, when the civilization which was established in Spain at the hands of the conquering Arabs itself borrowed from its connection with the inhabitants of the Asiatic coast by trade and other means, not to mention the original Greeks themselves being migrants from the East. There is also no dispute that unveiling a sufur reflects a primitive, primordial state of man, or that veiling ihtijab arose after <coughs> mankind's development of religious and moral conscience, which inhabits men from chaos in natural physical circumstances. Veiling prevents the means by which chaos uh, takes hold and acts as a barrier between males and females. And ve veiling was made as specific to women as opposed to the man because he is busy outside the house and because his position in sexual, sexual circumstances is that of a pursuer and the position of the woman is that of being pursued. So he seeks and asserts and she accepts or rejects. Her veiling is a medal of a rejection with which she is decorated in front of the man so that he need not be rejected and turned away by tongue or by hand and in it lies her security from being the object of man's desire. So if a man approaches her or tries to seduce her with his eyes and if she wants to accept his advances, she lifts her veil from him and he understands that she has accepted his pursuit. Furthermore, her unveiling for a specific man without his pursuit is a sign that she would accept his pursuit and lures him to seeking her. Her general unveiling is a symbol of general acceptance and enticement. Wow. Right? It's quite profound. It's yeah. quite profound. This is just one page. I'm just these are random as well. There's, yeah. there's so much uh, you can go through. But uh, I'm just going to go to a couple of other places and that's it. We're not going to go too much into yeah. it. Uh, he talks about uh, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the the translators put the subtitles in here, uh, unveiling how um, how it has become half nakedness. Because another obvious proof that the aim of modern unveiling among women is abnormal, incongruent with positive re reform, signals that those who seek to, uh, to, uh, seek it do so not uh, uh, sorry uh, seek it do not do so in good faith, and which does not increase women equality with men is the fact that they women are already being created free just as men have. One proof of the fact that the modern unveiling is abnormal and does not make women more equal with men, similar to how they already created free in nature like them, is that their unveiling does not stop at men's limits. Mm -hmm. They uncover their arms to their armpits, chest, backs and legs, while men consider unnecessary to rule any of these body parts at all. Mm -hmm. So he goes that the idea that, okay, you're trying to be equal to men, but then the common dress code for the non-Muslim Western society is that a woman exposes more than a man. Mm -hmm. So surely you've not gone equality you've actually gone beyond beyond so therefore it's not just the goal of trying to make you equal with man mm -hmm. right so it's quite uh some nice uh points here and <laughs> this last uh, section i'll read from it's from page uh, 88 he says another lie of those who attempt to minimize the harms of unveiling for the western women so he's basically making a critique of the view that look in our societies because we are much more open and we're more casual with uh the woman's body it's you guys that over sexualize things, right? It's not us. It's because you have, because everyone's like covered, you, your mind is running crazy, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas in our societies, we're okay with this, mm -hmm. right? We don't, we're not affected by any of that. So that's mm -hmm. the guy. So he calls it a lie. He goes, another lie of those who attempt to minimize the harms of unveiling in the Western women, who imitate the Western women, is their statement that the Western man, since he sees women with their bare limbs from his childhood and is raised among them, is not agitated by the sight of those limbs. Whereas it agitates the Eastern man, unfamiliar with their sight, who is new to this lifestyle. Again, it's a common... This is a point that's made even today. Exactly, right? Yeah. So look at his response that he says. He goes, this is an outright lie. Even if it resembles the truth insofar as it includes warning the, Western, uh, the Eastern woman from imitating the Western one. In fact, you might even be led to believe that it was said by the enemies of unveiling. Because it kind of minimizes the woman's yeah. uh, uh, beauty. Anyway, however, from another perspective, this point of view will be permissive for her, the Eastern woman, in the future if, she unveil, if the unveiled lifestyle progresses amongst us and our man's eyes become familiar with the woman's bare skin. Rather, the core of this point of view seeks to create a culture of permissiveness around unveiling in the current day by lightening its burdensome presence in the souls of Easterners and pacifying them with the promise of future familiarity. Despite this, it is both based upon a false claim that men in the West are not concerned or aroused by the sight of women unveiling their attractive limbs there. So that's the idea, based on this premise. Mm. It was false. So do the women of the West, when they beautify and flaunt themselves as they do, only do so in vain? Mm. Have they no goal when they do so? Do they not have desires they seek within men? And is there no desire for women on the part of the men who laid the foundation of Western civilization and created social protocols? That which includes dance parties and the women where they can hold their waist clad to their most revealing beautiful dresses? Have they, the men, simply lost their minds? Or have they, the women, simply lost theirs? Or is it the case that those amongst us who claim that the clothed naked women in the West does not arouse man's desire or even catch his eye are simply messing with the minds of Muslim Easterners? The idea uh -huh. that you can see 
people living in the uh, we'll touch upon this in the, in the following discussion inshallah is that there is this kind of notion when you're living in countries like Pakistan Bangladesh and you look at the West you think look there's no uh, you know um, uh, abuse towards women look they can walk around free no one does anything it's, it's completely uh, completely fine and that was what we were taught in the 90s and 2000s uh, only when the Me Too comes out is that these same very progressive institutions were hotbeds for abuse mm -hmm. which when we look back at it, it makes complete sense, mm -hmm. right? When you look at the Me Too movement, uh, where women were saying that in these, uh, you know, very progressive institutions, we were abused. Uh, and when you look, we say, of course they were abused. Yeah. Look at the setup, yeah. right? You're going to have, uh, you know, men and you're going to come here and present yourself to them. No mahram, no anything like that. And then you're surprised as a society that the person is ab abused, right? Mm. But at that time, we were made to look backwards, mm. saying, no, 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 it's you guys that over-sexualized this. It's just a friend. Mm. Right, that's why we're told that most of the people that uh, most women that get raped get raped by someone that they know. Yeah. Right, so we kind of we're told that no, it's because you over sexualize things. This is why you've taken this innocent relationship and you've made it something ugly. But then Mustafa Sabri is saying that's a lie that they're teaching you. Mm. So it may look like that. So we get uh, you know saying, well, you know what, we can actually progress to that level where we're no longer aroused by womanhood in that uh, womanhood in that sense. And he goes, this is a lie they're teaching you because if you go to their societies and you kind of break it down, you start understanding that it's all based upon this. It's can, all highly sexual. And you can see there's like a, a, a clear admittance of the fact that it's false because what arose from things like the Me Too movement, etc., was that um, it became a norm now in the workplace for if there's going to be a male co-worker co being alone with a woman, the door gets left open. Yeah, or this, sounds like someone read the book of fiqh. Exactly. <laughs> the door gets left open or the, there's a distance between the male and the female, etc. So for the sake of the female's safety. And it sounds like they've taken a leaf from the sharia and they've applied it. In one of the local state schools here, I was told one of the teachers that they have a policy, a no-touch policy. Mm. And no-touch policy meaning even amongst the same gender. Mm. Right, these guys have taken Sharia to another level. Right, the Sharia is like they're saying you guys are being too lenient <laughs> because you allow musafaha and handshake with men. They say no touching amongst any child. Wow, secondary school we're talking about, right? Yeah, no touching. So, um, and the reason for this is not because they read the Quran and Sunnah. Right, the reason for this is because they know you, you start to accept human nature. So anyway, Mustafa Sabri is quite uh, like I say, it's a hundred year old book, yeah. right? But it's very relevant. Yeah. I would highly advise. It's not a large book, right? We're talking about. Uh, you finish it within a couple of sittings. It's about 100 pages, just over 100 pages. Very useful footnotes. They give a lot of context behind it. Uh, they give further reading, etc. So I would highly advise this book, inshallah. So anyone that has an opportunity, I don't know how much it costs. Shouldn't be too much. Uh, we'll put the link up to where you can buy it. Um, it's well worth a read in the current context, inshallah. Inshallah. Now, moving on to the uh, main main part of the podcast, or the, the pre the introduction to the main part of the podcast. Yeah. We're going to be discussing about um, this concept of ikhtilaf yeah. and this concept of ulama, scholars and tulab al-ilm uh, when they have their intra-Muslim uh, intra discussions, they often differ with each other as to what Islam says about any given particular issue. And many a time that can result in Enmity, it can result in hatred uh, And that usually happens in the lower tiers Of the intellectual, uh, the intellectual um, scope of things, right? Where the less intellectual people are The more likely they are to have hatred and enmity For the sake of ikhtilaf mm. And uh, when you look at the upper echelons of scholarship The less that becomes uh, On a general level uh, With exceptions That would be true, I think you would agree In every field Yeah, It's not unique to Islam Yeah when you look at, if you're in the field of physics or biology, etc., whenever someone reaches a higher level of uh, scholarship or expertise, you start to realize the gray areas mm -hmm. and you start to become more humble. In And that's where even language changes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when you ask me a question, um, the answer usually is you should stay away from that. Mm -hmm. The answer is it's better to do this mm -hmm. rather than saying this is haram. Is halal or in the even context of even, medicine? Even, even if I if even if I ask you a straight question, not about halal or haram, but you won't be absolute in your language. You'll say this suggests. Yeah, it seems like it. It seems we like say it. those kind of language, and that's important because and people don't like that sometimes. Mm. A, little, a lot of the people that the general public they want to have a clear answer. But by the way, this is from the practice of our predecessors. Okay. So we know that from the era of the Salaf, right? Imam Shatibi has a section on this in his um, 
is i'tisam wal muwafaqat one of the two but he writes about this as well as other scholars that um, a lot of the early imams the tabi'un atba tabi'in they were very reluctant to say something is haram they will say ana akrahu dhalik i dislike that la mm. yu'jibuni that does not please me mm. and then the commentators say this is this is them saying is haram but they say why don't you say is haram because mm. when you say something is haram or even halal you're basically telling me that allah ta'ala has said that this thing is impermissible mm. so that's a scary um thing to if you think about it because you're speaking on behalf of Allah Ta'ala. And you possibly could be making something which is actually halal into haram. 100%. And haram and, and, into halal. Uh, Ibn Qayyim says that the Mufti, when he's answering, they should consider the fact mm. that they're answering on behalf of Allah's Messenger. So when you when you think it from that perspective, that should already humble you, even if you're relatively sure. Because it's not to say, oh, but isn't the evidence clear? Evidence is as clear as um, sometimes as clear as you want it to be mm. because if an ayah has been brought forth towards you or a hadith has been brought forth towards you and you think this seems very clear you can say look it seems it's permissible but a- every faqih every scholar knows that there's a, usually a possibility that there could be something that I've missed mm. so it's not because um, they were ignorant it was rather that a interpretation of this or the the evidence the the the, the authoritative nature of this evidence or the interpretation of this could be questioned yeah. and that happens to so this is anyone who's in the field of research or study knows this yeah. how many of you if you think about your version of yourself eight years ago mm-hmm. right where you were sometimes certain about certain topics and now where you're at right now mm-hmm. you look at yourself and laugh at yourself you think man i was so ignorant yeah right but at that time the confidence level was through the roof yes right now <laughs> and the chances are 10 years from now Inshallah, we look back, we say, you know what, man? Some of the stuff that we were saying was not completely accurate or I missed so much, Mm -hmm. even though right now I'm so confident. When you realize that, that means even stuff that you may think is clear, you still become reluctant to say the statement such as with definitiveness. Yeah, That's something that, um, uh, and that's a sign of ignorance when people speak like that. Yes, But that's appealing because a lot of general, the the general public then want to have clear answers. They have, they gravitate to confidence. 100%, 100%. And usually 100%. the most ignorant person is the most confident because he doesn't know 100%, 100%. the and, other things. And I think it's very important that in our discourse, it's just like a general advice anyway, and that, like for our imams and lot of, uh, some of the listeners that listen here are imams themselves or teachers themselves, is that we have this habit throughout the, our, which makes sense, is that when we kind of teach to the general public, we uh, dumb down the discourse to make it very simple. So for example, if I'm teaching something about zakat or I'm teaching something about fasting or salah, it's just... I want to make it in a way of do's and don'ts. Mm. So do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And the reason for this is, and it makes sense, is that the general public cannot understand, so so they can just simply know what to do. The problem now with that is it doesn't work as much because uh, everyone has access to information. So if I said, don't do this, and this person goes online and Googles it, and he says- why afterwards? Not just why, let's say they find a hadith to the contrary. Mm. Right? So if, as you'll see later, if I said to someone, don't do rough of your day, don't raise your hands in salah other than the first takbir. They're like, okay, they go online and they say it's a hadith in Bukhari. The Messenger Allah Sallallahu Alaihi raises hands, mm. and so you lose the trust of many people because of that. It doesn't mean that you overcomplicate it, but it's important that we expose our uh, audience to at least some level of complexity. Yeah. So therefore, they can appreciate there's some scholarship behind this. They're not surprised by it or get driven to doubt by it, uh, by when they're exposed to it by themselves. Yeah. So uh, what happens uh, a lot of times? Is um, students in maktab, for example, or even just general laity, they and what you mentioned, right? Uh, they'll hear the imam or they hear the maulana or someone saying something. They'll go home and or they'll go back to their friends group, a friend group where there might be someone who has a different opinion or follows a different kind of methodology. They'll hear something. Now immediately that creates doubt. So then they have to keep going back to that scholar. Oh, but, but what about this? Okay, but what about this? Or what about this? And then that scholar gets tired and annoyed and thinks, well, why does this guy keep coming? And this person doesn't get the satisfactory answer they need. Mm. If that if they had been exposed to it first, yeah. then that person, when he heard it from someone else, would be like, oh, I know about this. It's fine. Yeah. It's not a problem. 100%. And, and this is from personal experience as well. I don't know if you experienced, but personal experience as well is that when we used to go to certain imams, mm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this story, inshallah, is that, uh, so when I was about 16, 15, 16, I can't remember the exact age now. So you're first exposed to the how to pray salah, the sunnah way, mm-hmm. right? So you get brothers coming to you from Salafi backgrounds, they'll say, uh, we've got uh, a book of Sheikh Nasuddin al-Albani, rahimullah, uh, Prophet's Prayer described, of course the English, right? <laughs> they'll have not the Arabic, and they'll say to you that, look, here the sunnah method is this, the sunnah method is that. So when I went to the local imam, the local imam, I'm not going to critique local imams. I'll tell you why in a second as well, inshallah, because this is not, uh, it's unfair mm-hmm. criticism. But I went to the local imam and I said, uh, you know, they mentioned this hadith. What do we do? He goes, oh, no, no, these are great mujtahis of the past, right? And great mujtahis of the past are like expert scholars. So respect their scholarship. So even if you don't know the evidence, respect it. Mm-hmm. Now, in my 15, 16 year old mind, I don't know who Abu Hanifa is. Mm. I've never sat with Abu Hanifa. I don't have to understand his knowledge. I don't understand any of that. I don't know who Malik is or Shafi. These are just names for me. So for me to, for you to expect me to respect uh, Abu Hanifa, it didn't make sense. But now, of course, when you, if, if someone said to us saying, oh, by the way, this is Abu Hanifa's view. This is Malik's view. Mm-hmm. You straight away humble yourself. You know what? I'll be careful what I say next because mm-hmm. this is Malik we're talking about. Because we know who Malik is. We've read the Muwatta. We've seen the Kitab al-Asl. We've seen the Muslim Ahmed. Mm-hmm. These are things that we could not do with five lifetimes, mm-hmm. right? And so we realize that, so we humble ourselves. But to the 15, 16 year old self saying, I don't care who's Abu Hanifa. Mm. I never knew he existed two weeks ago, mm. right? And now you want to accept him despite the prophetic hadith. Mm-hmm. So this is why, uh, and so I was a bit like, um, I knew what they were saying because I, I think I was intelligent enough to know that it can't be that simple. Yeah. So even though I don't know the response, if you said to me that this is the sunnah, Right, and somehow everyone's got it wrong. It's possible, but it seems quite strange to me. Yeah. So therefore, I was uh, I was reluctant to accept it, and that's something just like a general message for people out there that if you see everyone's doing one thing, and someone's brought out like a simple hadith that suggests that it's wrong, it could be that the person is right and everyone's wrong. It's possible, but there should be at least an element of um, skepticism mm-hmm. to say why has everyone taken this other position. And usually, if it's ulama that take a position, not the general public, the ulama take a position, there'll be some reason to it. So yeah. let's at least expose ourselves to that. So anyway, so I, was, so I didn't know where to look. I eventually come, I went to um, uh, East London Masjid. It was like a program somewhere, I can't remember what it was, right? And there, um, I found the book of uh, Sheikh Riyad al-Haq, uh, which is called uh, The Salah of the Believer from the Quran and Sunnah. So mm-hmm. about 16 at the time, right? Salah of the Believer from the Quran and Sunnah. So I picked up the book and I started reading for it. And now, those ahadith that Sheikh al-Albani Rahimahullah may have said it was da'if Sheikh Riyad al-Haq mentions Imam Nimawi from Athar Rasul and saying it's sahih mm-hmm. So then I went back into my school And the person, the brother I was discussing with And I said, oh you know that hadith that you mentioned That uh, Sheikh, that is da'if Well did you know that this Imam Nimawi Now I have no idea who Imam Nimawi is I go, do you know this Imam Nimawi said the hadith is Hassan I don't even know the difference between sahih and Hassan right? <laughs> so he's Hassan and he goes Oh, um, who's this guy Nimawi Is he a Sufi? Right, so it's the most ignorant conversation we're having right now, right? Yeah. So I go, well, who's Albani? <laughs> well, I have no idea who Albani. You have no yeah. Nimawis. So what happens? We're we're stuck now yeah. because we've reached the peak of our knowledge, which is that I've found someone to the contrary that you don't know. You've mentioned someone else. I had no clue it was two weeks ago, and now we're stuck. And that was end of debate. Mm. And so then you start to realize you think, oh, so this is this can't be as simple because for me to get to the bottom of this. I need to find out what da'if is. Mm. I need to know what hasan is. I need to know what rijal is. Right? <laughs> and so you start to humble yourself. And so luckily it was quite an early experience that you start to realize quite straight. Like, okay, it's not as simple. So this requires hard work mm. to kind of realize what this is. Otherwise, and it's something that we're going to talk about because we didn't discuss this guy called uh, Engineer Ali Mirza, is that um, if I give this a scenario and you think about it for a second, right? And you can answer it. If I said to you, I go, uh, this hadith I'm making this up right That hadith is sahih right? but, that's in my, oh, Guess what Do you know it's actually da'if Why is it da'if Because in it There's a narrator called Muhammad ibn Sa'id And Addar uh, Qutni Said he is Matruq He's a discarded narrator mm. I've made that up right? Dar Qutni didn't say that right? Just to be clear Now You take that piece of information And you go tell people How long could you use that Without anyone responding to you? Not very long. Well, if you if, go to the public. If you go to public, then very uh, a long time. No one will ever do etirat. Well, let's say you go to students of knowledge. Okay, even most uh, students of knowledge, they wouldn't, well, there you go. They wouldn't do etirat to you. They would just kind of, okay, yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah. Because 
because most people don't know how to use books of Rijal. Mm-hmm. So I've just told you a fact, yeah. which 90% plus of the Muslims can't respond to. Because mm-hmm. they won't know who Muhammad Sa'id is. They won't know what a senad is. They don't know who Dar Qutni is. They don't know what Matruk means. Yeah. They won't know where to check books of Rijal up from. They won't know any of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you could basically go through your local masjid Go through your local imam, go for the next masjid, next masjid, and you're basically refuting people left, right, and center, saying, Oh, you know, that hadith you mentioned is da'if because Dar Qutni said that. Now, you don't know yourself what it is. <laughs> so, this is how uh, a lot of these people get duped into thinking that you have knowledge now. Mm. Why? Because you took that information, you refute your local imam. Yeah. Right? Local imam studied seven years in madrasa, right? You've been watching YouTube videos for a month, and you just refuted your seven. And you think, What's the point of seven years study where you don't even know that Dar Qutni has said this person is da'if? Yeah. You see right yeah. so This is how people get duped Into a set element of knowledge Even though I made that up mm. And you would be on that delusion For around Depending how long you want to be For three, four, sometimes years Until someone comes along and says oh, well, By the way uh, Did you um, Can you give me a reference for that Yeah Then then, then it's right? a problem Then, you, then you're stuck <laughs> So similar with this guy Using the Albani Has weakened the Hadith He was working a tree For a long time until, not me, but I just found another book saying, oh, there's this guy called Nima, we said it's Hassan. Right? So he was working, working, working until he come across an unknown guy called Nima, we said to the contrary, it was finished now. Mm. So now he realizes that if I want to go to the next step, I need to up my level. Mm. And that's how these things work. And people get duped. And this guy, Anjali Mirza, is a, I would say, um, is a champion of this method of uh, <laughs> discuss, and we'll discuss it inshallah. Sorry, you want to mention yeah. some stuff about the so, book inshallah? So uh, the book that we want to discuss as like a kind of, as like a, a message of how to actually do things and a message of how not to do things put together in one. So uh, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda, he has uh, basically, he has a publication of a risala written by Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, where uh, he discusses this kind of uh, concept of having this mutual love for each other in Islam without going beyond the scope of uh, violating another Muslim's rights, even if you differ with them in furu', even if you differ with them in in in, in issues of deen. So um, now I just wanted to mention some ibarat from there, some examples from the uh, scholars of the past as well that actually highlight this and brings us to a point where we know and we understand how we should act when it comes to different opinions or different stances on different issues. Because um, just in the issue of, or just in the concept of salah, there are so many differences of opinion. There are so many different scholars saying, or not so many different scholars, but there are different scholars saying different things about uh, the same action, which is salah, and yeah. it's each stage of it as well. But let's clarify this, because yeah. people get this confused. When they say, when they say ikhtilaf, Mm-hmm. We're talking about the peripherals of salah. Yes. Right? So the core of salah, the core essence of it yeah. is predominantly agreed upon. Gee. And that's with most aspects of Islam. Mm-hmm. So when, when we talk about, because naturally when we're going to have a discussion, we're going to mention ikhtilaf. Mm-hmm. Right? So like if you're talking about som, fasting, right? Everyone agrees eating and drinking and sexual intercourse during uh, the day of uh, Ramadan is breaks the fast. Mm-hmm. But then where the question comes about is what is defined as eating? Mm. Right? Where does the thing have to go? Mm-hmm. What about injections? What about this? And we can. What about asthma pumps? <laughs> On these discussions, you're going to have ikhtilaf naturally, mm-hmm. right? So when we're talking about, because you know, sometimes we highlight ikhtilaf, so people think saying, "But well, that means that we don't know anything." Yeah. Right. It's just ulama just making up. No, no, no. The core are well known. Mm-hmm. Right. I had this discussion yesterday. I was teaching a little class um, to a general public, and uh, the question of moon sighting comes up. Right, that why do we have ikhtilaf for moon sighting? So I mentioned a very simple point. I said, look, in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu he says, "Sumu li ru'yatihi wa li ru'yatihi." Right, so fast when you see it, and stop fasting when you see it, meaning you see the moon. Mm-hmm. So I ask a question now: Does that mean that if the moon is sighted anywhere in the world, you must follow it? The answer was probably. Mm-hmm. Right, that was the general. Thing. Probably makes sense mm-hmm. because the Messenger says, "Sumu." You fast, not in your locality. Mm-hmm. This is fast. But we know from the Hadith Sahih that Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu went for local sighting. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a famous incident of his. So now what do you do now? Do you follow the Sahabi's position of Abdullah ibn Abbas or do you go with the general statement of the Prophet mm-hmm. So now when you ask that, you're like, oh, I think I'll go with Ibn Abbas because the Sahabi said, no, no, but the Messiah said so. Right? So they're like, well, I'm not too sure. But that's ikhtilaf. 
Mm. Right? We don't deny the prophetic hadith, Sumuli Ru'yati. No one's denied that. Mm. It's not the hadith sahih that was a debate in this scenario, at least. The question is, what do we do here? Mm-hmm. And then, if I had to tell you that the ulama in the past have debated then, now if you debate about this topic, that means that just on this itself, mm-hmm. there is a valid ikhtilaf where there could be a different day of okay. Ramadan yeah. or fasting, right? There's a valid ikhtilaf here. Mm-hmm. So, you, how are you going to solve this problem? Mm. And he said, well, we have to tolerate it. You can't. That's it. ikhtilaf we're talking about. So yeah. no one denies sumul ru'yati that I'm aware of, at yeah. least, right? But it's the interpretation that we're talking about. Yeah. And that's why it's important to expose people to that so people realize. I had people saying, uh, it is definitive Quran and Sunnah to follow this style of moon sighting. I was like, are you, are you serious here? Mm. Right? Are you not aware of the book or the book, the, the fiqh of moon sighting and the ikhtilaf therein? Right? Are you talking, uh, did the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam express and, and it's so, it becomes so funny sometimes is that any position you hold, I can just take a contrary position to that yeah. and give precedence for it. Yeah. And you're stuck. Right? So this is why um, uh, when we're talking about ikhtilaf, it's, it's, it's on these details. Yeah. For, and that's why I was going back to the point that this is where you need to educate people about some of these gray areas. Yeah. Not to cause confusion, but to give them appreciation. Yes. Sorry, Karen. Uh, yeah. So, the and this is what... Um, is mentioned in the book so he starts off in this chapter he says he tied to say ihtiram al-salaf li afkari wa ara'i al-mukhalif and this is what we're trying to get at right now it says wala rayb anna as-salaf ridwan Allah ta'ala alayhim ikhtalafu fi kathir min al-masail al-amaliyya wa ba'd al-masail al-ilmiyya al-i'tiqadiyya which is a bit we haven't discussed yet but he says that there's no doubt that the salaf uh, may Allah be pleased with them all differed with regards to some action like some issues to do with how a person performs his actions of worship and some i'tiqadi uh, issues some uh, uh, issues of creed وما زال الاختلاف بين من بعدهم من الائمة واقعا في الفروع وبعض الاصول and that ikhtilaf continued after the time of the salaf amongst the ائمة amongst the scholars of Islam uh, in the furu and in some issues of usul din right ولكن هذا كان منهم من مع الحفاظ على ادب الخلاف but this was done uh, whilst also remaining uh, consistent or preserving the etiquette of differing opinions. المخالف, to have this kind of love and respect for the opinion of the opposing view. And to stay away from being basically having enmity and having hatred for the enemy, uh, for the not for the enemy, but for the opposing opinion. And to just, despite differing with, for example, the Hanafi differing with an Imam Shafi'i in a Far'i issue, you still have love for the Shafi'i and you still encourage being together with the Shafi'i in a uh, general sense. والابتداء والابتعاد عن التشتت والتفرق فكانوا رضوان الله تعالى عليهم عباد الله إخوانا متحابين متعاونين على على البر والتقوى they were brothers at the end of the day despite the differences and he gives some advance uh, uh, he gives some examples of this and one that really gives me uh, that really culminates for this is culminates this in it is uh, the example of Imam Malik ibn Anas mm. Imam Malik he wrote his muatta and his muatta became very famous. The entire ummah was trying to study with him. And they used to do fakhr when they did study with him. And they would say, Haddathani Malik. That was like a source of pride for everyone. To the point where Harun al-Rashid re- greatly respected him. And actually studied with him. And at that point, Harun al-Rashid was so content with his madhab. So content with the opinions of Imam Malik. He just said to him that, look, we will hang your muatta on the Kaaba. And we will tell the entire ummah. As of today, you follow the method of Imam, of Imam Malik. Now he's telling an Imam who has staunchly disagreed with the other Imams around the Muslim world um, that I'm going to give preference to your madhab and make your madhab the madhab of the Muslims. But then Imam Malik's response, he says, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, in ikhtilaf al ulama rahmah min Allah ta'ala ala hadi al ummah, kulun yetba'u ma sahha inda, wa kulun ala huda, wa kulun yuridu Allah ta'ala. Right? O Amirul Mu'mineen, the ulama, the ikhtilaf between ulama, the differing opinions of ulama is a rahmah from Allah on this ummah. Meaning, what? Well, don't force them to be on one opinion. Everyone follows what is correct according to him, and every single person is on guidance, or, or these ulama, and all of them intend the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, this is something which shows the you the attitude of Imam Malik that despite me believing my madhab to be the most correct. 
my madhab to be the most authentically uh, closest to what the Prophet ﷺ intended, I still acknowledge the fact that the ulama in other areas of the Muslim world who have the same view about their own madhab. So mm-hmm. we can't do il- ilzam on everyone to follow me. Otherwise people will fall apart. And then he makes another ilzam example. Ilzam here means make something binding. Yeah, to make something binding. Because in yeah. Urdu, ilzam means to accuse. Oh, no, we don't, want, we don't want to get no, confused. No, because we're going to have few Urdu speakers probably different thing. Why are you saying ilzam? <laughs> ilzam in Arabic means to make something binding. Yeah. It still has a connotation with the Urdu word because it's still sort of making binding, but ilzam is negative in Urdu. Ah. It's to say accusation. My standard for Urdu is muqatih, so you're going to have to educate me here. Always. And I think the second example that um, he gives, another example that's really, really pertinent here, he gives it with regards to Imam al-Shafi'i where he mentions that um, and, and this is mentioned by Imam al-Dhahabi in his Siyar al min Nubala where he says that uh, one uh, a student of Imam al-Shafi'i Abu Musa Yunus ibn Abdul A'la al-Sadafi al-Misri he said ما رأيت أعقل من الشافعي I never saw anyone more intelligent than Imam al-Shafi'i ناظرته يوما في مسألة ثم افترقنا that we debated regarding something and then we went our separate ways then he came and he met me afterwards he took my hand and he said is it not appropriate that we still remain brothers even if we don't agree in a particular mas'ala and then Imam al-Dhahbi comments on this he says he says that this shows you the complete intellect or the, the the perfect intelligence of Imam Shafi'i and his own kind of understanding of Islam because equals will always or contemporaries will always differ with each other mm-hmm. with regards to issues right so this is like a um a, a brief kind of understanding of these things yeah. that and this is like the Imma Arba yeah they were they, they're like the elite upper echelon scholars mujtahidun you know, people that we look up to and say that these are the best of the best. And if they are having differences with each other, as we know, but at the same time had respect for each other, then we should kind of adopt that kind of manhaj as well. Unless, uh, and, and, and you know, for fear of, you know, bad mouthing others and uh, falling into, you know, unnecessary riba, etc. Yeah. But there is one question here now. Because and 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 this whole risala is based on this whole concept, but you do have examples, and this is a question I'll, I'll post to you here, that despite you have these examples of ihtiram and um, you know the ulama respecting each other, the ulama saying kind words about each other, right? You still have examples of ulama using harsh words. Mm. Um, you can say almost bashing each other in the books that they wrote. When they discuss certain masail, so I can give an example. For example, uh, Imam Ibn Hazm in his Muhalla, he does this throughout his book. Uh, mm-hmm. And with regard to the Imma Arba'a, especially Imam Malik or Imam Abu Hanifa, he doesn't hold back. Yeah. Um, I remember in the chapter of uh, Witr and whether it's wajib or not, he discusses this, and then he says um, that, uh, and he brings the side point about. Um, Riding an animal and um, uh, praying the witr salah, and he says, Hadi sunnatun jahilaha Abu Hanifa. Hmm. This is a sunnah that Imam Abu Hanifa was ignorant of. And he also criticizes Imam Malik and he criticizes Imam Ahmed who, because they, ha- or I think it was Imam uh, Malik had the opinion, or Imam Ahmed had the opinion that um, if you do not if you do not pray the witr, then your shahada is to be hmm. uh, not accepted. And he was like, he was very harsh with them as well. Yeah. So you have this kind of language and even Ibn Taymiyyah himself was very harsh with his language. He would uh, be very harsh against the Ash'aris or yeah. against the Maturidis when he was discussing Usul din So how do you deal with this kind of a... Yeah. This is actually quite interesting because the book of Sheikh Fattah Abu Ghudda, which is called Risalat, uh, Risalatul Ulfa Bayn Muslimin, trying to bring people together <laughs> and his immediate... <clears throat> audience was the Salafis mm. when they were having debating about furu issues of Salah etc and they're kind of getting quite heated uh, so he kind of says alright let me get the disciples of two people so he gets Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, and Ibn Hazm their, uh, uh, you know, their writings about trying to bring people together and the reason why he strategically chooses them two is because that's these are respected revered figures amongst um, uh, uh, amongst, uh, uh, amongst Salafis so he kind of brings those two together and um, and so it kind of shows that the principles are trying to highlight. 
Now, that being said, and it's not a unique feature of Ibn Taymiyyah or Ibn Hazm or for anyone for that matter, is that um, we always find scholars, whenever they are discussing, they feel more strongly about certain topics than others. If you were to even on a lower level like ourselves, there's certain things that I'm very opinionated about or very passionate about, others I'm not. And then those same topics you may be very passionate about because of your experiences or because your exposure to the evidences or how you understand the evidences. So that's natural. Right. So what's important here? Let me uh, and we're going to come to this. We talk about Ali Mirza as well, inshallah. Right. I'm going to detail some examples with uh, at that time. They'll uh, note this as well, inshallah. Is that if, for example, a mujtahid like Ibn Hazm, in his view, he thinks that Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik or one of these other imams gets it really badly wrong, mm -hmm. right? And they must be ignorant. And he's very passionate about this, and he's uttered such language. Right, a mujtahid or a great scholar, that doesn't give us the right to go and utter that same language about that imam. Mm. And you say, why not? Well, the simple reason is as follows: is that there is no imam with the save of a few people talking like Abdul Mubarak, etc. Right? The vast majority of the imams out there, scholars out there, there is someone that has said something negative about them. Mm -hmm. It's very rare to find any imam that you find something not negative about them. So, if you want to go down the route of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah, can we not find people saying stuff about Ibn Taymiyyah? Imam has, Dhabi. Has, uh, but Imam Dhabi, yes. But we can go into it. Takfir of Ibn Taymiyyah has been done by Imams as well. Yes. Now we're going to say, well, scholars said so. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I don't know. Imam says he's a kafir. Someone says he's a kafir. You're not going to accept that, right? Mm -hmm. So unless you have reached that level and you want to start to critique, then no problem. Mm -hmm. and that's why when people say, like I had this uh, person come to me the other day and he was like, um, do we have to follow like a scholar? Like, oh yeah, you follow a scholar, of course. He goes, can I look at evidences? And I go, well, yeah, you can if you want. But if you do, learn your Arabic language first, uh, study the relevant sciences, right? Read the relevant hadith, go to the books of Dalai and Madhab, and if you can weigh the evidence and do tarjih, then go for it. Mm -hmm. The reason why I said this is because this guy didn't know Arabic. Mm. So that's going to be a, like a five, six year journey at least. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the five, sixth year, you're not going to be saying these silly questions anymore. Yeah. So I, I, I don't even tell people don't do it. Yeah. I say, just do it. Right, but before you do it, do if things. I do these three things, when you do that, you're gonna humble yourself by that time anyway. Exactly. Right? Very few people won't, but most people will because the second you learn Arabic, you get exposed to the books. I say, well, go to the books of Dalai Madhab. So now you want to go to a mas'ala, right? Uh, go look at Ibn Abdul Bars at Tamheed, mm -hmm. right? Go look at um, uh, uh, Sharmani Athar Imam Tahawi if he's got a chapter on there. Go look at Jassas, go look at um, um, Nawawi, go look at Ibn Hajar. The second you start doing that, and you try to navigate, you start thinking, oh, I don't really know what's going on here. There's a lot of right? There's a lot going on here. I don't have time for this. Mm -hmm. You know what? Let's leave. I just follow my imam. <laughs> and that's what happened for the vast majority of people. Mm -hmm. So I say to people, go for it. Go become, go become a mujtahid. No problem, right? But make sure you do this first. Mm -hmm. When you say that, majority of people will go and say, you know, I don't know what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Or they kind of get past the first hurdle learning Arabic. Forget that. Yeah. They'll say, I've learned Arabic? Okay, how long? Two, three years? Okay, two, three years of learning. It's not gonna, it doesn't happen. So, uh, I actually go challenge him Go do it So if you want to If you want to speak like Ibn Taymiyyah mm -hmm. Right If you want to speak like Ibn Hazm Or you want to speak like Bukhari etc Because they criticised people Then get to some level, similar level And then you can deserve to speak like that mm. Right That would be my advice And because scholars themselves That's one thing How they feel passionate about it Number two Is that uh, Scholars are human beings and we spoke about this before with some of the, the Sahawi, uh, Siyuti difference, Ibn Hajar, Ibn uh, Badr uh, We are contemporaries and they have a lot of harsh language for us. So they're human beings. So within that, you have emotions, you have... Um, uh, misgivings. Mis yeah, misgivings. Students are causing problems. We have it today, right? Mm -hmm. He said this about you. He said that about you. And then it kind of causes this a lot of uh, What do tension. you say regarding so-and-so? <laughs> we were talking about this. just before the podcast about yeah. how you frame a question. Yeah. So sometimes a person may come to you and ask you a question in such a way that it's just basically telling you to say this is just condemn it. Yeah. So we have all of that. And the same ulama that say this, right? So that you that are sometimes harsh like this, they're the same ones that note this. Mm. So you have this discussion in the books of uh, Ulum, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in Ulum al Hadith about narrators, about Mu'asirin, contemporaries, yeah. that don't take contemporary criticism of contemporaries. Why? Because there's jealousy, there's a lot of other things going on. Mm -hmm. So if I'm criticizing you, we're both alive, I don't, there could be something here. 
Whereas when someone's passed away, you tend to have a more of an objective view regarding the person. Yeah. So that's why you know we, we get this kind of uh, discussion where biases, etc., kick in. So um, it's a very strange methodology. Mm. And you see the guy who talked about Ali Mirza and others, they kind of ca- catch on, is that they only look for the negativity. Mm. So what they would do is they'll look for these kind of harsh remarks where they haven't, they haven't reached that level at all, mm-hmm. deserving of having those kind of strong positions. And they would pick on those to try to present a very negative view of Islamic history. You know what this reminds me of is um, an incident that happened, and I think it's to I think it was involving one of the Ghaznawi uh, sultans. I can't remember who exactly. I think it was Mahmoud Al Ghaznawi. I can't remember exactly, and which scholar was involved. But what happened was um, the sultan he basically put out a message saying, "I've heard about the I, I follow the Hanafi madhab, but I've heard that there's a Shafi'i madhab, and I want to know about it, and I want to compare between the two, and I want to see which one's more correct." So they couldn't find anyone else except for a Shafi'i scholar to come and discuss with him and tell him and teach him about the Hanafi madhab and the Shafi'i madhab so he could choose. And so what happened was uh, he went there and he, he basically tried to discuss with him. The, the Sultan said, okay, show me the Salah according to the Hanafi madhab and show me the Salah according to the Shafi'i madhab. So what happened is the, 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 the student or the, the, the scholar and he got, and he basically said that, and and to arbitrate, I'm going to get my Christian and Jewish um, aides to read the books of fiqh to prove that okay, which one's right or wrong, so we can make sure it's fair. So the Shafi'i scholar, being a Shafi'i, he prayed the Shafi'i, uh, the Salah according to the Shafi'i Madhab in the best way it could possibly be, in terms of like observing every single recommended thing that Imam Shafi'i said, proper, you know, khushu, everything, and then he went to the Hanafi books of fiqh and he prayed the Hanafi he rep- represented the Hanafi madhab in the salah by taking every rukhsa that Imam Abu Hanifa gave for specific circumstances and prayed the salah according to that so for example he did his takbir in Farisiyah he did um, he wore uh, you know some clothing that was filthy or whatever or something like that right and he prayed it to that point until the Sultan basically said where that can't be the salah of Imam Abu Hanifa so he got his Christian and Jewish aides to check it and he found, they found it in the fiqh books knowing that it was rukhas but that wasn't mentioned mm. and when the sultans heard that this is actually mentioned in the fiqh books he became a shafi'i mm. but that re- misrepresentation that ta'asub is what leads to this enmity and this baghda yeah. which we can avoid That uh, incident you're talking about comes in uh, is mentioned by Imam Jawaini in mm. Mughit al-Khalq ah. it's, it's Mughit al-Khalq and it's actually at the end of it, he says that, uh, so in the Hanafi Madhab, they will say, for example, that tashahud is necessary. So from the time of tashahud, and if you break your wudu after tashahud, then your uh, salah is still valid. Mm-hmm. So this Shafi guy, as Jawaini says the story, um, he sits for tashahud and then he passes wind. All right? I don't know how he times it that great, but he passes wind at that time. And then he kind of finishes and starts saying, well, I'm, I don't have to do this salam because my, I've sat for that time. Mm. Uh, Imam Al-Qawti has got a, re- a refutation of Muhitul Khalq. It's actually quite an interesting back and forth. Where what Jawaini writes his idea in that and then uh, go through his one. But uh, if you want to find the original story, you'll find it in the Muhitul Khalq of Imam uh, Jawaini, inshallah. But yeah, that's uh, 100% true. So just a couple of points here <laughs> before we move on. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, the Risala of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimullah, and even the Risala of Ibn Hazm, um, some of the stuff that they mention has been mukhtalafi some scholars may take as more because basically what Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah is talking about is salah mm. and about the ikhtilaf in salah and a lot of these ikhtilaf go back to the sahaba mm-hmm. and therefore you shouldn't be condemning one another right uh, but even then like some of the stuff that he mentioned as being ikhtilaf in uh, some scholars of Madhab take it quite seriously yeah. right so Ibn Taymiyyah take a much more of a relaxed view saying this all goes back to the salaf and therefore we need a respectful view on that. So it doesn't mean that every detail you're going to necessarily agree with what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying, but it's the spirit of what Ibn Taymiyyah is talking about, yeah. which is very important. So that's why um, uh, if you're going to read, uh, it's a small risala. Sheikh Fattah has got a small introduction. Uh, then Ibn Taymiyyah's risala has got a couple of sections he's put together and Ibn Hazm at the end. It's about 140 so, pages in total. So 140 pages, yeah. So it's not take too long. And so if you read it, uh, whether you agree with every single detail is irrelevant here. The point we're trying to mention here is that uh, the the the... This is them talking about the, the unity or trying to bring people together. So therefore, we should highlight those points. The, if there are places where they've used language which is inappropriate or they're very passionate, then we should qualify that saying, Ibn Taymiyyah holds this view very strongly. Or if you think that they've gone overboard, say, okay, they've said that. We try to abstain from mentioning those things. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do with everyone, by the way. This is something that uh, really annoys me sometimes. Is that if someone, for example, has said something like this, something negative or something very bad or something, right? We don't have to advertise it, mm. right? And if you think, why not? 
just for, unless it's a purpose, but why not? I'll say, well, let's say we sit and start talking about your parents, right? And we start talking about, because you talk about, like, say, Sahaba. Mm-hmm. You talk about engineering in a second, right? That talk about Sahaba. <laughs> then, well, let's go and sit about and talk about your parents. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about that? Talk about all the negatives and talk about, and say, oh, it's purposes for Islah, all right? Just to expose what happened in history. Mm. So um, if you don't feel comfortable about that Unless there's some real purpose behind it But a lot of the times people are trying to mention all these negatives To kind of show Islamic history Or the, the fiqh tradition is worse like when they're, they're, when they're really going at each other mm. And we can look back at Heinz and say Okay they may, may be a bit over, over the, overboard uh, But what even uh, what Shaykh Fatah Baghud is saying This is the default This is what we're kind of working off Our Islam talks about uh, Ulfa. Uh, Ulfa And that's what the whole thing is premised on And of course there'll be some things Where you feel passionate about mm-hmm. And not Ulfa is not always required Yeah Right, we're going to be sometimes harsh as well, where we think harshness is justified. Yeah. We have to demonstrate that, justify it, and then say this is why we're being harsh. Yeah. Right. So as long as you can justify it, so it's not just you know let's all sit, sit together and just you know. Uh, Sing kumbaya. Yeah, that's not the idea here. The idea here is that there's a premise that we work off, mm-hmm. uh, and this is what Sheikh uh, Fatah the highlight. So basically, looking at the best of us uh, of our of our turath, of our inherited scholarly tradition and highlighting that, inshallah. Now, so before we move on to Engineer Mirza, who is not a scholar no <laughs> exactly so we want to because we've been talking about the ulama and the uh, the way the ulama interacted with each other and the way the ulama would respond to each other in debates etc now there is a discussion or there is a concept in islam regarding the authority of the ulama mm. and to what extent a layman sitting at home who not understanding the intricacies of islamic sciences needs to follow the authority of these scholars of the past and present, and what the role of those ulama is, what the role of that ulama is in Islam for the layman and for just in Islam generally, yeah. uh, as opposed to the Christians and the Jews. I mean, yeah. is that authority an absolute authority? I mean, speaking on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like you mentioned in, in, as a mufti, mm. um, is that a tempered authority that is tempered by, you know, how correct someone is, how is that judged, how is that weighed, how does a a person navigate through that. Yeah. So we don't have in a um, like a set authority of scholars. So you don't have like a scholarly board mm. uh, historically. That's just not been the case. It's been something that um, through your competency, that's why it's, it's very egalitarian in that sense. Anyone could be, a, be an alim. Mm. And that's when we look at the early tradition of the scholars that we talk about. These are Mawali, mm. freed slaves, and these are people becoming great imams. <laughs> people described as being quite lowly in terms of uh, social, status. social status But then they become Great imams Because um, Once you have knowledge You have knowledge And this is why uh, It's actually merit based It's meritocracy In Islam, Islamic history So when someone's A good scholar They're a good scholar That's just the way it works Can't deny it uh, We talk about Ibn Hazm We mentioned mm. right Ibn Hazm Is an uh, imam Of a madhab That doesn't exist anymore In any meaningful way yeah. Odd people may ascribe themselves to the Zahiri madhab But the Zahiri madhab That he was ascribed to Doesn't exist But his books Are still being published Right, you just quoted what Ibn Hazm said about Abu Hanifa, but Ibn Hazm still mentioned Hanafi texts. Yeah. Right, go to any Hanafi text or Dalaid etc. They'll mention Ibn Hazm's na- name, not attacking him, not mentioning his points yeah. or evidences. Despite what he said about Abu Hanifa, despite what he said about Malik, despite him following a method that doesn't exist. Yeah. Why? Because you have something to offer. Mm. If his scholarship is good quality, we'll take it. Mm. Right, it, because that's just the way it works. If someone is not being cons- giving much consideration to, the chances are because they didn't have much to offer. Right? That's the way our scholarship works. So it's very much based upon that. So therefore, if you want to... Uh, so we don't have like a set ulama class in Islam. When I say in Islam, I'm saying, I'm saying in terms of the Quran and Sunnah has not laid it out. It's just said those who are knowledgeable, mm. then people are ignorant, they'll ask people that are knowledgeable. Mm. It's as simple as that. So someone you can even be an alim, but you don't know about a topic, you ask another alim. That's the way Islam to the Quran and Sunnah. But naturally, in terms of trying to uh, organize... Uh, affairs, you start having an ulama class that are being recognized by other ulama. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, a scholar would judge a scholar. So I became, Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, he is an imam, right? And so therefore he has students and then he kind of does tazkiyah. He says, this, this is an imam. You mm-hmm. want to take from, take from this. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi does it himself. Mm-hmm. When learn Quran, go to who? Go to Ibn Mas'ud, mm-hmm. right? So therefore we have uh, this type of tazkiyah taking place where scholars recognize scholars. And that kind of works quite, uh, you know, smooth, not relatively smoothly, where, um, the general public are quite easily divided from the scholarly class who are the um, uh, are divided to their own category, and there are um, sometimes where there is a uh, a bit of a 
uh, a battle for the authority where you have you know the qasas, the storytellers, mm-hmm. right? The qas they refer to as a storyteller, and so these were people that what we can call today like da'is, mm-hmm. you know, people that maybe uh, I don't want to like they are ulama on uh, platforms of social media as well, right? But I'm saying is those that are uh, du'at that we just give da'wah to Islam, we just talk about the breach of Islam. They don't have knowledge of the deen, they don't have fiqh, they don't have hadith, they, they don't, don't have engage that. in those intricate sciences. <laughs> they don't get, yeah, way. so there's nothing wrong with them, yeah. but they, but then what happens is naturally in a person's mind. The general public think this guy must be an alim because he talks about deen, yeah. right? So therefore, that was in the past as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ibn Abi Awam's uh, uh, Abi Hanifa, he has a story where there was a storyteller time with Abu Hanifa, and so Imam Abu Hanifa's uh, mother wanted to ask a masala, so she goes to Abu Hanifa and say, "Take me to that guy," All right? Despite her son being Abu Hanifa. So then when he goes to that guy, he goes to him, look, my mom wants to ask you a question. He's like, what are you coming to me for? You're Abu Hanifa. He goes, but she just wants you, she doesn't take mine, she wants to take from you. So she asks the question, he looks at him saying, this is right? He goes, yeah. And he gives her the answer and then mother goes, okay, that's fine. Right? That's the way things work. Yeah. Right? People are like that. <laughs> so um, that was there. But it wasn't, uh, and so people, even Josie actually write a, a, a risal on this, trying to tell people, these are storytellers for us. These are, these are like these du'at. You don't go for them for ilm. But that problem has just exasperated so much in the modern world because people have more literate now. Mm. People are more, so uh, with that coming in, literacy coming into play where everyone can read for themselves. Um, and you can probably argue that the level of scholarship has decreased to some degree. So that big gap that would have been from the, the layperson to the alim in the past, uh, the alim level has come lower and then the lay people have become more, re- uh, can read more. So there seems to be a bit of a uh, close, closing of the gap. Yeah. Um, is to some degree perceived. Why? It's because those who are actual ulama, if you compare them to them, there's still a massive gap. Yeah. But because we have a lot of people that are studying in institutions and they come out and we call them ulama, maulanas, etc., uh, who don't have the opportunity. And this is why I'm, I'm not criticizing this. Mm. Be very clear here, right? I'm not criticizing these people because I completely understand that when a person graduates after six, seven years of study, so let's say an average person studies for six, seven years. After six, seven years of study, you're trying to pick up Arabic language. You're trying to learn usul of fiqh, fiqh, Quran, tarjima, uh, uh, hadith, ulum al hadith, ulum al Quran. Whatever these sciences, you can't become an expert in any of that in seven years. You're trying mm-hmm. struggling for half the time learning Arabic, and the second half you've got trying to learn these ulum. So once you graduate, you need to earn a living. Mm-hmm. Living in the West, for example, or living in Pakistan, or the country we're talking about, right? The context of this, um, you need to earn a living. You need to go become an imam somewhere. When you become an imam, you need to be dealing with social issues. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be talking about uh, hadith and fiqh most of the time. And the fiqh is very basic most of the time. You're Much less talking. anything to do with the usul. Teaching kids, yeah. right? Teaching, uh, you know, marriage issues will come, counseling, bayans. That's what people are concerned about, yeah. right? So um, you're not going to become the great alim. So when you have, uh, and then some people have to go for, have other jobs, like in the, in the West, you don't necessarily get the imam job or you can't afford to live with the imam, uh, imam pay. Or you um, you want to become a teacher in a madrasa, but the madrasa don't offer the hours. Mm-hmm. So you have to get, get a normal job. So you may be a postman or you may be working in an office from nine to five. Then you come home, try and teach a bit of maktab, and then you're trying to read and study at the same time. So naturally, those people we're talking about, naturally, the level's not going to be super high. So a person who's doing a bit of reading at home, got a bit of spare time, there may be a perceived lower, lesser gap. So those people start to have a perception that these ulama don't know anything. Mm. But the actual ulama that are still researching and studying, there is no comparison between the two. There's no comparison at all. Mm. So what's an obligation for the person is to understand that this tier of ulama, they are people that are not necessarily doing the research themselves, but they are people that have accessed ulama and they are basically presenting to you their views. Mm-hmm. So if you want to challenge them, right, or if you want to question them, you have to realize that you're not necessarily going to get all the answers from these people. And it's not because the ulama class, the Hanafi madhab, the Shafi madhab, or Al-Azhar University, or Dalun Durban is poor. It's because these people don't have the opportunity or they don't have the ability, whatever the reason may be, to reach the high level, to do the research and study the intricacies. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand and respect that. That was the point I was trying to get to earlier on, was that if I was to give you a fact, and I said go to the imams and try to debate them, you probably win most of the debates. Mm. Rather, I would say go beyond Islamic ulum, mm-hmm. right? If I gave you a week, I said to myself, for example, I gave myself a week to go and look up all the evidences for anti-vax or something, right? And I went to my local GP and debated him, I'll probably win. Mm. Why? Because I learned the relevant arguments to go debate that GP. Do I know anything about medicine? No. no. Right? But I've learned the relevant facts, the, the, the stats to go and refute that guy. But if that guy, because he has the tools, was to dedicate himself to the topic, study of the topic, there'll be no comparison. Yeah. So that's where we have to kind of understand where there's this false sense of 
uh, you know, degrading of scholar, scholarship. Mm-hmm. So the lay person, the uh, the Quran is quite clear. Fasulu ahl dhikr in kuntu la ta'alamun. Ask your remembrance if you don't know. Ahl dhikr here has a broader term, most, uh, but it's been trans- uh, the tafsir of it has been done of the ulama. Yeah. So it's a very rational principle. Go with people that know when you don't know. Yeah. So the people who know are those who study the deen, you go to them. Mm-hmm. That's the basic outline in Islam. It's very loose. And so therefore we make ourselves boards and scholarships and certificates to kind of make it easier for people to discern whose scholarship is what isn't. You're not going to have uh, universities in the strict linguistic sense in the Salaf era. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have uh, you know, certificates and BAs and bachelors and masters, etc. That's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. But these are basically tools or methods for us to, what we call my tazkiya. Yeah. So when uh, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Learn Quran from these people That's Tazkiyah Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Or Abdullah Abbas says about his students Or Ibn Mas'ud says about his students And so on so uh, Abu Hanifa talks about Abu Yusuf That Tazkiyah That's our form of today Through certificates etc That you've studied this many years Yeah That's all it is Yeah Does that mean every student Is going to come out great? No mm-hmm. Right Just like not everyone That does a bachelor's Or a master's in physics Or something Is going to come out as a great as well That's just the way it operates Yeah and 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 now why this is so pertinent is because when we move on to someone like engineer Ali Mirza, yeah. who isn't a scholar, but is very heavily involved in discussing issues and critiquing ulama of the past and the present uh, on issues which, unfortunately, he doesn't have access to the actual sources to read up on, yeah. but discusses them in a way and with an air of confidence that suggests that he... Has done that reading or has yeah, done that research, course, yeah. and unfortunately, he's become very popular for this. Um, I don't know how many. I think he's got mil, he's got millions of subscribers over in Pakistan. Two million. Over two million subscribers in Pakistan, and well, that's his channel. He's in Pakistan. He's so in his Pakistan. Channel, yeah. his, his audience will be wider, I assume. Uh, yeah, that's true as well. And 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 he's blown up as like a populist figure. Yeah, for the kind of crowd that are pushing this or believe in this thing that. The authority of the ulama is not something which we have to just hold fast to and stick to, mm. um, but rather it's free and open for anyone to come yeah. and challenge the. The thing is, when I speak ideas. to you about this, for example, right? Yeah. You're like, we're not that, because in the UK, yeah. we're not too like, uh, we. Uh, I like to think most of us that have been born, born and bred here will not get duped into this. Why? Because we've experienced the Salafi movement from the 90s. The hardcore, you know, no madhab movement. And we've seen the Salafi movement develop over the last two decades, have come much more respectable madhab. Now Muslim followers, madhab, they may be Shafi'i, Hanbali, uh, they study madhab now. Uh, and so their uh, development we've kind of seen with our own eyes. Mm. So we're like, oh, we're having that debate again. Yeah. Right? That, oh, don't follow ulama, follow Quran and Hadith. Yeah. We've heard that rhetoric before and we've seen the problem before. And to be honest, the, 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 it sounds bad, but the best solution to this is time. To let it just play right? out Is that when those same people Are going to then go into studying If they do ever go into it They will start to realise that Oh, I'm not really following Quran and Sunnah I'm following this guy <laughs> Yeah Right And this is why uh, I think it's very important So I, I, I don't want to uh, What we're going to do inshallah I mean, We do critique someone There's two ways of critiquing someone Because right now We've just mentioned general points And it just seems like We're just attacking Without any evidences So of course Listeners are going to listen to this There's a few qu- things So we can critique his methodology Which we will mm-hmm. And we can critique his uh, specific points. But why is this guy so popular? Right? That You may think like, why is this guy who's just a for me, engineer? For me, as a person coming uh, from the UK who doesn't speak Urdu um, uh, in, in, in the fluent sense, I can understand a little bit here and there. But when it gets into like the real vocabulary, I'm totally dumbfounded. I don't know what's going on. For me, when I look at someone like uh, Ali Mirza and I see he's so popular, I myself, I don't get it. And 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 not only do I not get it, but when I when, when, from the things that I've heard about him, it's like there's no reason for him to be popular, mm. and it's so strange for me to see that he's popular for the things that he's popular for, yeah. when in fact he's not saying anything profound. A hundred percent. Yeah. So is that <laughs> now the <laughs> the only way you realize this is if you understand some of the dynamics of Pakistan. Yeah. So just to be clear, uh, um, engineer Ali Mirza is an engineer. Gives it away, right? Uh, hasn't studied in institutions. He's kind of studied with certain individuals, uh, people like Sheikh Zubair Lizay, uh, who's a famous al hadith scholar, passed away a few years ago. Um, they studied with these people. Doesn't know Arabic. And I'm very sure of this. Right? I don't think he's ever claimed to know Arabic. I don't think he's ever claimed not to know Arabic. He's kind of left it mysterious. But I'm very sure he doesn't know Arabic, and I'll tell you why as well, inshallah. But anyway, so um, he starts his YouTube channel. And there's a few things at play. So you have to understand the dynamics of Pakistan. In Pakistan, uh, because I can say this because he's from Jhelum, 
I'm from Jhelum as well. So, and I don't come from a family of uh, people that are in, uh, relation, related to the madrasa. So I don't have like Hufad or, you know, Madaris graduates, etc. My family, none of that. So I have very standard Pakistani figure people, right, that pray Salah, relatively religious, but not what you would consider associated with the ulama, the ahlul ilm, basically. So I'm the first one in the family to actually kind of go to madrasa and study in that sense. Uh, that Even from, I think from a father's side as well, from both sides. Anyway, so when you go to Pakistan, uh, just some anecdotes and most people here that uh, who are listening who are from Pakistan who re- who I'm sure would agree with this is that there is a bit of a distaste towards the ulama class mm. the maulanas the Molvi class there is a distaste towards them uh, some of it you may argue could be justified because they may have had bad experiences to so the local Molvi remember, remember these Molvis are talking about there's no distinguish between a graduate of a madrasa and an old man with a beard yeah. they're all Molvis right so if there's an old man with a beard he teaches just children uh, Quran he's never been a madrasa day in his life he's a Molvi Right, they are called a Maulana, an Alim, Qari Sab. If a person is the Imam of the Masjid, never studied a day in his life, but he's the Imam, he's a Maulana. Now, if he goes and starts to attack kids and say silly stuff and do whatever, right? Look what the Molvis are doing. Mm. So there will be no distinguish between an actual Alim and a non Alim. Number two is that even those that were ulama, our ulama in Pakistan, there was and has been an issue of sectarianism, mm-hmm. which is that. Um, the deb- debates between the Barelvis, Dobandis, and Ali Hadis within the Sunni or within Shia, but generally within the Sunnis, right? These three groups, uh, which started in the subcontinent, once partition took place, uh, Muslims became a smaller minority in India. So in India, the sectarian debates don't, because they've got bigger concern. They've got these Hindus to deal with, right? So they ain't got <laughs> a ch- uh, opportunity to sit and debate about some of these ibarat that your imam said this and your mullah said this, or uh, can you give the dalil for this? Mm-hmm. It does take place, but to a far lesser degree. Mm-hmm. In Pakistan, where you've technically got Muslim, your Muslim majority, uh, you may even argue like a semi-Islamic state, whatever, right? There's much more opportunity to debate these things. So therefore, a lot of the imams use the mimbar to kind of debate these furu'i issues, attack very specific people. I remember, again, this anecdote of my own experience, from a village in Pakistan where uh, the Imam Sab in Ramadan stood up after Taraweeh. Right? I was there. It's not talking to someone I heard. I was there. After Taraweeh and he says, you know one of the problems that we have are munafiqeen. Right? One of the problems we have is munafiqeen. And these munafiqs, right, they make, they blaspheme against the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the biggest munafiqs is Ashraf Ali Tanwi. Right now, if I was to tell you that no one in the audience knew Ashwari Tanwi, it's a village. Yeah, no one in the audience knew Ashwari Tanwi was. What yeah. is? Sorry, no one has a clue who he is. So, why is this guy using? And this is a relatively sensible person. Why is he using his time after Taraweeh, where you've got so many social ills in the community in the village, to talk about a person they have got no idea about? And the book that he referenced was even Ashwari Tanwi's book. He misattributed the book. He was referred to uh, the book by <coughs> Sayyid Ahmed. <coughs> <coughs> uh, Sayyid Ahmed Shaheed He misattributed that book to It's called Sirat Mustaqim To Mul Ashwai Tanwi Whatever the case So that's happening So you have a bit of like A distaste towards A lot of the ulama class And therefore you have this m- the Modernist camp That gets quite popular mm-hmm. But the modernist camp Doesn't look the part Right You're in universities Clean shaven etc So This guy Muhammad Engineer Ali Mirza Comes in saying You know what guys I agree with you These Molvis Are the problem mm-hmm. Right? And not just the is ignorant, not just the Mulvis, it's these madahib. Mm. It's Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Malik, the Hanbal, sorry, the Hanafis, the Shafi, Malik, it's they are the problem. It's these Sufis, they're the problem. And you know these stuff that you say about each other, the Ahadis say about the Brelvis that they've done shirk, and the Brelvis say about Dubandis that they blaspheme, and Dubandis say about this, that they've done this, right? That's all true. That's all true. It's meaning what they've said about it is all true. So therefore, I'm going to use those arguments against each other and nullify all of them. <laughs> so basically, if I accuse you of something, you accuse me of something, our cameraman comes and says, you know what, you're both right. You're both deviant. <laughs> right? There's no, uh, there's no uh, independent research here. It's basically, uh, Dilbandi said that about them. Yeah, that's true. They are <laughs> like that. What did you, that's true as well. And these uh, you know, ignorant folk are saying, what, what, what a profound <laughs> argument. He's done nothing. He's done nothing. All he's done is taken these you know, uh, arguments and used again saying what the uh, Brelvis have said that Qasim Lanotwi has denied financial prophethood. Mm-hmm. He did deny, deny it. <laughs> right? Oh, and then this Dobandi said that Ahmad Raza Khan, he denied something as well. He did deny it. <laughs> so you both become deviant. So now you've wiped out the ulama class because they kind of refute each other, cancel each other out. And then you kind of adorn yourself saying, I'm not a modernist. 
right? Although he's ignorant enough not to, he's, he's ignorant not to know what a modernist is, and so therefore he has the beard of imama, and he uses YouTube. Mm. He uses a YouTube at a time when no one else was doing YouTube the way he was. We're talking about 2009, 2010. That time YouTube, right? Where you know a person could be uh, doing anything and getting views. So he goes at that time on YouTube and he uh, culminates a following where you get the people thinking, oh, you know what? These ulama are deviant. This guy's telling us a Quran and a hadith, very clear. Here's a verse here, and this is you've been duped by the ulama. That's mm-hmm. the idea. You've been duped, so you feel like a victim. They've been hiding things from you. Yeah, so this is a hadith in Bukhari. Mm-hmm. They didn't tell you this. Yeah. Right? Here's this hadith. They didn't tell you this. They're trying to eat your. They're trying to uh, consume your money. They're trying to do this. They're trying to and you know going through all of the things and the people are just lapping it up. Right? This is amazing. This is amazing. This is amazing. I give you the hadith number. You go look at it. And then this kind of culminates into even uh, his views regarding Sahaba. Mm-hmm. Very negative views where Sahaba like Muawiyah Sufyan or the the language he's used is you know horrendous. Right? Based upon hadith which are da'if. Mm. Right, so he's actually mentioned stuff against Sahab, which are based on Da'if Hadith. All of these stuff are documented. So what I'm going to do, inshallah, I would mention a few other points. So therefore, it's not just me mentioning stuff about him. The listeners, what I've said so far, if you're a follower of Engineering Mirza, forget what I've said right now. Mm-hmm. Right, because you can say, well, the ulama do deserve it, or they have blasphemy. Okay, no worries. Right, I'm going to mention to you guys specific mistakes and ignorance of this guy. Right, and then I want anyone listening. If you want to respond, you're more than welcome to respond. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, th- I think that's answered why we're responding to him as well. Now we've got an article that's been written. Yeah. That's been responding. That's responded to him as well. Yeah. Do you want to give us? A bit yeah. More? So, um, one of the things that someone can argue is that w- what he speaks in Urdu isn't it unfair that you speak in English? Ah, yes. Right. And I think that that is a fair criticism. The only th- issue is that my Urdu is not that great to speak. I can understand Urdu. I can read Urdu. I can even write Urdu, but I can't. Uh, speak Urdu that well and especially Some, Someone like me you, I don't have no access To the Urdu world yeah. In that sense Like very little access To the Urdu world N- Not relevant to me Yeah So I'm saying What's the point uh, yeah. for, for, for this right But I'm saying is Why am I doing in English Because I'm saying Firstly it's a language barrier I, can't, I can try to speak in Urdu But I don't think It'll be that great And then people might Take out mistakes of And vocal mistakes <laughs> I've made right um, Number two is that To solve that problem We've got an article Written in Urdu mm-hmm. So I wrote an article In English Which has been translated To Urdu so that will be, an, inshallah, accessible hopefully with the podcast when it gets published. If not, a few days after, a week after, you'll be access to it. So therefore, there's no such thing as saying, why do it in English, right? We can't understand or not always going to understand English. Well, you have an article, go with it. Mm-hmm. So you can listen, read the article where I cite here what he said, a link to the YouTube page, you can or the, 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 the video, and then I respond to it. And it's in Urdu with the references. You can check it out yourself, inshallah. So therefore, you can't make that point. And number three is that uh, I've tried to watch his videos. Right, and we've done a lot of reviews of books. I've read a lot of books. I've read a lot, a lot of figures. I've read people like you know people that we disagree with, right? We like Sheikh Nasruddin Al Albani. You talk about uh, even this Sheikh Sheikh Zubair Zay. People that we disagree with. But when you go, when you read it, there is still some sort of knowledge that you're trying to engage with. I've not seen in my life, right, someone this ignorant and confident at the same time, <laughs> right, on this level. And then you're talking about some crazy uncle in the masjid, right? But if you're talking about someone who's this ignorant and this confident at the same time, I've seen ignorant people. <laughs> I've seen confident people. I've not seen the two come together, this, this, uh, you know, this marriage of ignorance and confidence uh, ever before, right? At this level where you have this much following. It's, it's baffle, it baffles me. <laughs> and I'm not worried. And the reason why, uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, and he says this a lot in his videos. So the time I'm watching his videos, it's, it's very difficult So I, I have, when I'm going somewhere I'm listening to it When I sit and listen to it It's too difficult <laughs> So I'm Because it's just so much It's mistake after mistake It's blunder after blunder Misunderstanding after misunderstanding Historical inaccuracies Arabic inaccuracies Everything you can think of It always culminates together In these kind of Package of ignorance Right <laughs> So um, I was um, uh, So I was listening to him And he was talking And he goes um, He has this thing He goes Go to um, If you want to debate with me Right Our differences Take it to uh, Take it to the Gora the white man, <laughs> right? Because the white man is objective. Again, it's that point I was talking before is that this idea that we were talking about Mustafa Sabri's work, yeah. that we look back at the Eastern, look at the Western and say, these are more civilized. Take it to the Gora. Now, we're not going to get a white man to decide whether he is, uh, you know, uh, right or wrong, mm. but you get the closest to a white man, us guys, right? <laughs> we're born and bred in the UK, right? We've studied in the UK. Our affiliation to sectarianism, I hope people can see, is not 
we're not crazy is it like that right mm-hmm. so therefore we can look at you objectively so we're going to get the closest to a gora unless someone comes tomorrow the podcast the white man wants to discuss, <laughs> discuss this right discuss. otherwise it's the closest thing you're going to get so therefore you can get a semi gora discuss uh, <laughs> the forms, forms of uh, engineer mirza and see for yourself uh, the the accuracy and inaccuracies of him so hopefully that mm-hmm. explains why we're doing in english mm-hmm. uh, and hopefully you'll get an urdu article for those who dis- uh, struggle to understand some of the stuff i'm saying because uh, of the Urdu language, you're more than welcome to just read the Urdu article and you can respond to those points, inshallah. Before we get on to like, the specifics, there's one specific issue that I know we want to discuss, but um, he has a website w- yeah. where he publishes his quote-unquote research. Yeah, research. Uh, and we've we've done a couple of them. <laughs> it, it was terrible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I just want to hear from you so that everyone understands that he has his website with these articles on there discussing various issues, uh, some in English. Yeah, and some in Urdu. Yeah, the ones in English is the ones that we went through. And That's then, for you guys, yeah. right? But it's quite bad English, right? But the idea was that. Um, so again, when someone comes with a da'wah, mm-hmm. the first thing I ask is, uh, "Can I see something in writing?" Yeah. Right? If you've got videos, okay, no problem, right? But if there's like someone's come out with a claim, if have you written something that we can see or read, uh, that's appreciated, so we can kind of understand what we're dealing with here. So in his um, videos, he says, "My research papers." Remember, he's arguing that this is the pure following of Quran and Sunnah. If you go to his website, ahlupak.net, something it's called, right? Ahlusunnahpak.net. Uh, you go into it, uh, you see, he says, "I follow just Quran and Sunnah, no sectarianism, no group affiliations, just pure Quran and Sunnah." Uh, you know, we want to unite the ummah, mm-hmm. right? And again, we spoke about this nonsense of you know, unite the ummah. It's very easy. How just follow what I do, and you'll be united, <laughs> right? That kind of nonsense rhetoric that I still can't, I still don't understand how a intelligent person can be duped into that, mm-hmm. right? That uh, everyone can be united. Just follow me. And we saw what Malik said, yeah, right. If Malik didn't feel that he was competent enough for the ummah to be united behind, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> exactly. Right, Imam Malik is saying, "Don't use my muatta, <laughs> yeah. right, for everyone to get behind." But then this guy feels confident with the engineering degree to come along and say that I'm going to unite the ummah because of my Quran and Sunnah. But let's look at it. Yeah. Right now we're taking the mick of his ignorance, right? Yeah. But let's look at the, the research. So you go to his website. Anyone go on it, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was going for it. I was like, what, "What is this? What's this amazing research?" So I was ready to, you know, because you this, this uh, profound. I was, you know, when we were doing the uh, the Israel Palestine thing, right? I was listening to Finkelstein a lot and uh, Shapiro. Mm-hmm. This is, I, was re- I was reading a lot of them. I was trying to watch a few videos, not too much, just a few videos. And so one of the time, the first time when Finkelstein gets exposed to Ben Shapiro, so he goes, "These are his videos. Can you respond?" So he is like a five minute clip, and Finkelstein listens to it and then reacts to it. One of the things that Finkelstein says, and this is what I kind of felt, was that he goes, "You know, when you I heard his name, Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, and so I was kind of getting ready when I got the video. You didn't get a bit of nervousness, like." Okay, I need to like put my hat on, my re- academic hat, and get you to respond. And when I listened to it, I thought, "This is, this is baffling the level of ignorance, right?" <laughs> and that's what I felt. So anyway, so he, you go to his website, and he's got his research papers. His first, uh, one of the first research papers I saw was um, on the um, the refutation of Abu Hanifa by Ibn Abi Shaiba. So it's well known that in the Musannaf of Ibn, uh, Ibn Abi Shaiba, he has a chapter called Al Rad Al Abi Hanifa. Mm-hmm. And so he brings, I think, 114 narrations which he believes that Imam Hanifa has, uh, you know, gone against the hadith. Mm-hmm. So I thought, oh, this guy's serious. He's got basically like a tahqiq, an analysis of the Rad ala Abi Hanifa by Ibn Abi Shayba. Because uh, as he should know, which I would assume, that uh, there's been a number of attempts by Hanifi scholars to respond to Ibn Abi Shayba. Mm-hmm. Imam Gauthi has got a response to Ibn Abi Shayba. Uh, Sheikh uh, Baharaiji in his Mawsu'a, he's got introduction, he's got reference to Abu Hanifa. Uh, his name is, um, it's called Makan uh, Imam Hanifa fil Hadith by uh, Abdu al Hadithi, I think his name is. He's got a response to Ibn Abi Shayba. And in Urdu, I'm sure there is as well, right? So I thought this is going to be like a proper, you know, tahqiq. His research paper is a scan of the Urdu translation of Musan al the chapter of Rad al-Abi Hanifa. <laughs> He's so he done did, no tahqiq. He did, he did what they did back in the day when they published When the they run. published it, yeah. But, but this the Urdu, Urdu version. Yes, yeah, so it's advanced. It's the Urdu translation. Just that part. He scanned it as well. <laughs> right? He scanned it. No footnotes, no additional points, whether he agrees or disagrees or what his tahqiq is, nothing. Just the That's run. a research paper. It's in the research section. Right? Majah did that in my master's, right? I said, like, you want to research? Well, I'll scan you this book, right? It took a 10, 15 minutes, right? So can you please give my master's... Nonsense, right? And they're calling it Mujaddid of the era. This is oh, Tajdeed, no. right? Oh, no. Then the next research paper, I'm going through, looking through, right? I'll look at the interesting ones. 
So then there's got a research paper on um, the views about Ibn Taymiyyah. <clears throat> All right, and I thought, this is solid, right? <laughs> that it's gonna, what's he going to present here? So he has the Urdu section, so I click on it, and his research paper is a scanned uh, copy of Abu Bakr al-Ghaznawi's Urdu Deobandi scholar, where he refutes Ibn Taymiyyah. Right? It's not his research. He's put Abu Bakr al-Ghaznawi, and Abu Bakr al-Ghaznawi in this Risala in Urdu, you go check it on his website, he defends Mulan Qasir al to be against the whole accusation of Khatamiyyah, which Ali Mirza accuses him of. <laughs> and he doesn't comment on that. It's a scan. It's a scan. He's never typed up as a scan, so there's no place to comment. There's no hashi as well. Right? It's baffling. <laughs> and then um, he's got like a section on like a uh, recent paper on shirk, like all ayat regarding shirk. So I thought, okay, this would be decent, right? So, you know... I was um, going to make an excuse for him saying that maybe he misunderstood the word research and paper together, meaning something I've just read and now I'm going to show you <laughs> what I've read. <laughs> but if he's posted something that he disagrees with... Him, yeah, no, but he doesn't read it. He doesn't read it, that's why. And I'll show you the example. He doesn't, read, he doesn't read the stuff, right? He just puts it up there. He doesn't read it. So anyway, um, he got to his, like on, on shirk. So again, when you're doing a research paper on shirk, the first thing I'm going to know is, can you please define to me shirk and ibadah? We yeah. spoke about it on a two-hour exactly. podcast on Muhammad Wahab, right? So he goes, look, uh, in his video, he talks about his reason. He goes, these people don't even know that Allah said, Iyaka na'udu, Iyaka nasta'in. <laughs> right? And that's his dalil. Right? That's his dalil. And so he lists all those ayat, and not one point is there a definition of shirk, any attempt, or definition of ibadah. It's just ayat that everyone knows that he's placed into that section, saying this is the uh, my research paper, which is collecting of ayat and relevant hadith. Again, as a research, <laughs> right? And this guy, and by the way, those who want, uh, the, when I quote here videos, if you want me to send the, the, the clips, I've seen them, I've got them saved, right? I can send it to you, inshallah, right? This guy claims that he goes, people go to Al Azhar University, Medina University, what university was it? Al Azhar, Medina, uh, Umul Qura, and they study there, graduate, and then they become my students. <laughs> right? So you're telling me an Umul Qura graduate, or an Azhar graduate who's done a master's, who's done a research paper, is going to come to this guy. And this is his research, knowing that his ustad's research wouldn't get passed to the, you know, when you go to uh, Al-Azhar, you have to do the high school, then you get into the program. Yeah. You won't get into the high school. <laughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's a scan of a photo, you've just collected the ayat that talk about shirk. Ajib, ajib. And this is the research papers. <laughs> right? So before we even get into his videos, right, that's the level we're talking about his research papers. The rest of the research papers that he talks about, like Salah, etc., right, he will mention a hadith. And then he will mention the grading of Sheikh Albani or Sheikh Zubair Zay on the two gradings. And then we'll go to the next point. Mm -hmm. The next point. There's no tahqiq. There's no engagement with the opposite view. Mm -hmm. Right? That what have the other ulama said? None of that. Zero. Mm -hmm. Right? So anyway, so this is what we're kind of dealing with when you first go just objectively. So forget his videos. Go to his website. The Urdu articles. If you're going to go to the English one, then there's problems. But I don't want to go down the route of taking the mic out of English language. That's not our job, right? Yeah. If I speak Urdu, you can take the mic out of my Urdu. So I'm not going to go down that route. Uh, other mistakes, like when he makes Quran mistakes, whoever, right? Again, I'm not interested in that because you can say slip of tongue. I'm not going to attack people on that. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at just meaningful things. So mm -hmm. this as a research. So if you're following this as your ustad, right? And that's the research that's being presented to you. Know that that would not pass as a... Uh, if someone did that to our madrasa, a first year student or second year student that would not presented that, it's plagiarism. That's why <laughs> it's, it's nothing. It's, you, you, it's like you don't know anything. You just picked up a book. Congratulations for picking a book up. <laughs> And right. reading, and or, reading, or, or, or reading, or half reading of it. some of it, right? That's what the thing is. <laughs> ajib, ajib, and people sometimes, and and, and we sort of take it seriously, right? Um, and the harsh language that we're using, or what we kind of seem like we're doing, um, <laughs> for those who have viewed him, you'll see the harsh language. So this person has accused, uh, you know, uh, ulama of all sorts of ills, all sorts of evils, right? Uh, he's accused Sahaba of numerous and again uh, we'll demonstrate all these points inshallah so on the Sahaba one I haven't got time right now mm -hmm. but we can go through those this, where he uses weak narrations to demonstrate um, uh, Sahaba as well inshallah okay let's uh, move on to so in the article yeah. just to highlight what I do in the article is that um, uh, some years a couple of years back when uh, there were some people in the UK that was starting to follow his views and so um, one of them Kind of, uh, they, and they'll, they'll ask my father to ask me, or someone to ask someone, can you ask, can you answer his stuff? And I'll be like, who is this guy, right? And they go, uh, we we'll send you a couple of his videos if you can respond. So they'll send these videos, like hour and a half, two hour videos. And in there, is, there's like 20 minutes of content, and it's like hour just 
attacking people and making jokes, etc. Right. So I understand where the because you've got charisma, so that Punjabi charisma, and I can see why people are uh, attracted to that. Mm-hmm. But in terms of ilm, there's nothing there, right? So I was like, I'm not going to do responses to an hour and a half. So I'll go, is there something shorter that he just mentions it and delight? So there's two videos where he takes a critique of Hanafi Madhab, mm-hmm. such as uh, Masail, such as, um, uh, for example, rega- reciting Fatiha in Janazah, mm-hmm. right? So when he takes his views, he's not saying, let's be clear here, he's not saying that. Fatiha in Janaza is Sunnah because of the uh, because Abdullah Abbas said so in Sahih Bukhari. Uh, other ulama have their views, no problem. No, no, no. He's saying this is the Sunnah, and then he mocks mm-hmm. the Hanafi mocks, mm-hmm. even like the likes of Sheikh Al Maniks are didn't mock mm-hmm. the way he does, right? So people that take other views, he mocks the view, saying this is a joke. They've lied to you. They don't know anything. You've been duped, mm-hmm. right? Not being aware that the view of reciting Fatiha. And not reciting uh, tilawah or doing tilawah uh, of Quran in Janazah Salah is mentioned by Ibn Abi Shayba through, uh, to, to 11 Sahaba and Tabi'un. Mm-hmm. He's got a chapter on this in the Musan of Ibn Abi Sorry, uh, yeah, Musan of Ibn Abi Shayba. Mm-hmm. Or Musab al Razak, one or two, right? He's got 11 people that he narrates this to. Uh, Ibn Mundir mentions this from numerous of the Salaf from Sahaba and Tabi'un that their view was there was no tilawah of Quran in Janazah, Janazah Salah, mm-hmm. right? So I basically highlight this. So I say, he says this. This is ignorance. <laughs> he says this. This is ignorance. Here's the hadith from Abu Dawood where Janazah Salah Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned by Abu Huraira. No uh, Fatiha is mentioned therein. Mm-hmm. So the purpose here isn't to say that your view is wrong because that is a view from the, uh, the from uh, from the Salaf, right? But it shows you his ignorance of the opposing view, mm-hmm. right? And I list a number of these views uh, within it. And the second thing I do is um, is this idea that he has of. Um, where this comes to ignorance as well, because you know, in the beginning, you read from um, Shaykh Fatah Abu Ghudda, and Shaykh Fatah Abu Ghudda said that some of the Salaf they differed in Aqidah. Mm-hmm. And so straight away, people say, How could you differ in Aqidah? Mm-hmm. Isn't Aqidah part of the foundation of Adin? Isn't it fixed? Isn't it fixed, Aqidah? <laughs> so you have to understand that there's a distinction, and this is ignorance again, there's a distinction between Usul Aqaid mm-hmm. and Furu Aqaid. Mm-hmm. So there's those aspects of Aqidah which are established in the Deen, there's no doubt. Believe in Allah, messengers, etc. There's no doubt about this. Mm-hmm. And then you have aspects of our aqidah which we can have ikhtilaf on. So, for example, the details of uh, mi'raj. Mm-hmm. Didn't Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam see Allah or not? Uh, Sama'a mawta. What's the nature of the dead hearing? Where there's not going to be exact explicit evidences or there are contradicting, seemingly contradicting evidences or ulama of ikhtilaf. Those are still belief because you believe in it or you don't believe in it. But this is where there will be an element of ijtihad in. And there's a scope of leniency with differing views. In those topics, definitely, yeah. right? So because there's, there's been ikhtilaf on it. Yeah. So like, um, he because he, he can't make that distinction. He's not aware of this distinction. He kind of lumps it all together. Oh, no. So one of the examples that he says is for uh, is that um, he's in attack on the Dubani ulama, right? The, uh, so one of his like key critiques is of the Dubani ulama is in Al-Muhannad al-Mufannad, uh, which is uh, a book written by Mullah Khalid al against the uh, uh, takfir done by Mullah Ahmed al-Zakhan of the Dubani senior scholars. So in it, um, they say that we believe in the fuyud of the mashayikh, mm-hmm. right? The fuyud is like a form of, um, what's the word for faith? Um, it's not baraka, but it's like a, uh, um, anyway, those who don't understand what faith means, right? It's like a type of uh, thing that emanates from the sheikh. It's the fuyud of the mashayikh they talk about, right? Um, so because we believe in that. So it's like a separate to baraka, but it's like this type of, uh, it's a Sufi terminology. So he goes, prove this in the Quran and Hadith. Mm. The few of the mashayikh. But again, because of his ignorance, if you were to go back and actually see what the ulama who accept for you the mashayikh, what they've said, so Mona Ashfali Tanwi, who's actually a signatory of Muhammad al Mufannad, in his Imdad al Fatawa, he's asked regarding the few of the mashayikh. Another masla as well, which is relevant to this, is that what is more afdal, right? The, the earth upon which the Prophet is buried or the arsh, mm-hmm. right? So he goes, provide from the Quran and Hadith the Correct evidence for this. Well, how can you believe that the the the, the, the ard is more virtuous? So, Murashid mm-hmm. Tamiz asked both these questions a century ago. Mm-hmm. So, if you had Mutala'a reading, you would have read this because mm-hmm. you claim to have read all this stuff, right? You'd have read this. When Murashid Tamiz asked about this, he says that this comes under the topic of furu of aqaid, not usul aqaid. So, for you, he goes, the Quran does not affirm it, does not negate it. The Surah does not affirm or negate it. If we've experienced something, we mention it. it's not part of our aqidah in the terms of being Muslim or not Muslim. Mm. This is uh, in his Imdad al Go to right at the end, you'll see his fatwa on this. Similar on this topic, he goes that what is more afdal is a vanni issue. It's speculative. It's not qat'i. Mm-hmm. In vanni issue, you can use evidence to char, vanni, and you can even use ijtihad. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. So therefore, if someone holds a different position, if Angelina Mirza says, I believe this is more of that, no problem. Mm. But because you can't distinguish between usul uh, al-aqaid and furu al-aqaid, you lump them all together and say, this is aqidah. Yeah. Right? So I, I highlight this and I give examples and references of this in the end of the article as well. Mm -hmm. So to kind of, because his major error that he's made regarding this mm -hmm. uh, is also highlighted. Now, as like a, a specific example, you wanted to go through the example of Raf'u um, al-Yadayn. Yeah. Which is a very contentious issue for those who enter into the field of study of fiqh and whatever not. They come across this issue of raf al yadain and they see this debate between the, um, the the ulama who are inclined to uh, hadith, the Shafi'i scholars, the Hanbali scholars, um, and uh, what you can say is Ahlul Ra'i or Imam Abu Hanifa and the Madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa. And the Madhab of Imam Abu Hanifa says, You do not do raf al yadain uh, before and after ruku'. And the other scholars who are muhaddithun and you know inclined to that path, they say no, you do raf you raf al yadain as the sunnah. Um, and then there's a massive debate between them. Loads of books and things have mentioned about this, but then Ali Mirza comes at the end and he brings his tahqiq. Yeah, he brings he brings his tahqiq uh, based on his uh, reading and his level of knowledge and his methodology, and he gives pref preference to doing raf al yadain. Yeah, and he. Brings a critique of the Hanafi position mm. and the ahadith that the Hanafis bring to uh, prove that you do not do raf al yadain. Yeah. Um, now, how does he go about doing this? Yeah. So, um, if you do have time, you can go online. I think it's 2013, 2014. He keeps referring back to this amazing research he did. Right? It's not written. This is a video. I watched half of it. It's very difficult to watch. Very difficult to watch. Right? Uh, and so when he talks. Uh, Injani Mirza from the few uh, videos I've seen of his when he talks, he, he says, I have on a topic, so I have five ilmi points, <laughs> calls it, or ten ilmi points. Oh no. So he has like ilmi points regarding it. So in uh, Iqtida of his Sunnah, right, I have ten ilmi points regarding his video on Rafi Udain. <laughs> um, so he says, <laughs> um, he, he says, uh, so number one, the first ilmi point. To refute his thing, he, he goes up. Uh, he makes Rafi Udain a firqa issue when the Hanifis of India have long stated that this is an issue of valid ikhtilaf. That the, the Hanafi scholars, now, if you're talking about, ra so this is a problem that you do, it's, it's, we call straw manning, mm -hmm. is that you look at the worst defense or the most radical defense or something, and then you make that as the position. Mm -hmm. Now, in the subcontinent, Way before him, so over here I've got a book written by uh, Alama Anwar Shah Kashmiri on the topic of Rafi Udain. So it's a, it's a four disciples in there. The second disciple on this is the topic of Rafi Udain. And he starts off his disciple by saying that, and this is the dominant view that people have now, is that it's a valid ikhtilaf. Mm -hmm. right? Rather, they go even one step forward and say that you can do both, it's just between ikhtilaf and awla and khilaf al awla. Mm. So some early Hanafis were more strict on this, but the view that this he has taken, which is probably more dominant now amongst the subcontinent Hanafis that he is living amongst, is that ikhtilaf in raf and not in raf is awla khilaf al awla. This is better. This is uh, uh, this is lesser. This is better. Yeah. That's the way they kind of view it. So he's saying within that context that this is a major firqa issue in the subcontinent. It's not. <laughs> it's not an issue in firqa, no, issue, right? If you have individuals that condemn Rafi Udain, will ask, tell us an alim. Mm -hmm. Who has not? I went to the masjid and some, my dad did this to me or my granddad did this to me. No, an actual alim who studied that has made this issue as a firqa issue, like a, a sectarian issue, mm -hmm. right? The most you may sometimes have is that because people that do raf udain are usually associated with a certain group, they may condemn that person's action because it's associated with the group, mm -hmm. but not the action itself. Yeah. Right, that's not a firqa issue in the subcontinent at all. Yeah. Right. The idea, and no one does it. We've been around this, uh, you know, living in the UK for decades now. Right. Um, when's the last time you saw an alim condemn Rafi Udain? Any Hanafi scholar? I don't think I've ever seen any. You won't see any it. at all. But hardly any. Maybe get a few people. I don't know, right? And but I've not seen an alim. Conversely, on the other side, if you go to a masjid that does, uh, where the majority of the Muslims do Rafi Udain, if you don't do it, they don't. They hardly, yeah, no one cares anyway. So there will be some ulama may mention them, bayans, etc. But yeah. hardly you're going to get an alim mm -hmm. that's going to come to you and say, why don't you do Rafi Udain? Yeah. And the same is subcontinent. We've got in Jalem. Right, where we go to pray salah, our local masjid where we had that imam once upon a time, right? That said that even he, by the way, backtracked on that after. But you go to there's a person in Rafi Udain there, no mm -hmm. one says anything, mm -hmm. right? I've studied from a Dubani madrasa, they let me lead salah, there's a Brelvi masjid mm -hmm. that's in the same city. We're not talking about like I've lived somewhere else in the UK, in the same city. The idea that they don't pray salahs, but it's, it's not as big as issue as he claims it is. Yes, there will be individual issues, we're talking about amongst ulama at least, it's not an issue. So that's mm -hmm. the first ilmi point. Uh, to demonstrate this uh, He mentions his literature review 
So you, know, you have to do a literature review before you do studies, right? <laughs> oh no. So um, I thought as a literature review that you know you're probably aware of uh, the, the chapter on Sharmani Athar Imam Tahawi because you're talking about the opposite, the Hanafi yeah. views that you read, right? Because I was not aware at that time that he didn't know Arabic. Yeah. So I thought Sharmani Athar Imam Tahawi, he's got a chapter on this. Uh, there's a lengthy commentary by Imam Badr Aini Nukhb al Afkar. Yeah. He's got commentary on this as well. Al Aini also in Binaya uh, discusses the topic. Um, Ajawr Naqi of Ibn Turkmani He discusses this as well And I'ala Sunan There's a lengthy chapter on this Alam al has got a whole book on it <laughs> Right This is readily available He's got a whole book on it um, And the list goes on and on The scholars that have discussed this <coughs> So I thought Who mentioned that He mentions two Urdu books That he's read on the topic And he's not I'm pretty sure he's not read them <laughs> I'm pretty sure Because some of the points he's mentioned Are actually responded In the Urdu books That he's talking about <laughs> uh, But he mentions two Urdu books <laughs> So if you're talking about Actually having students from Al-Azhar uh, coming, if they've done basic literature review, they'll say this is not research. Yeah. Right. Now you may argue, and this goes into our third enemy point. You say, well, <laughs> you know, it takes time literature review. Mm -hmm. Right. How long will you take to do your research on Rafi? Then you think. Uh, me personally, to cover these books that I told you. At least two three months minimum. Yeah. More than that. But what if I told you he claims as a third enemy point, it took him five years research. This is in the same video. But that's the way he resulted with. That's the result after five years research. <laughs> So it wasn't, so he had five years to read this, right? I reread this uh, over the last week, <laughs> right? I'm not a Rafi Dane expert. Uh, that's not my field, right? <laughs> I'm not a Rafi Dane uh, field guy, right? It took me, la last week I read this again. I went through Sharma and Thar chapter again, which you've done, right? I'm sure it doesn't take five years, right? It so five, five years, years, right? He's not even read the Mukhalif's main books. Not because uh, It's not his fault He can't read them Yeah Alright He can't read them But then what did he read for five years? The two order books uh, I assume so And, and the, the Quran and Sunnah isn't it? The Quran and Sunnah right? All those ayat about Rafi Yudain He was going through with tafsir He's and looking for the chapter in Bukhari He's just looking yeah. for it He went from Badul Wahi Okay <laughs> Fourth ilmi point Right Fourth ilmi point He says He claims because he does not take money for teaching because that would mean that he wouldn't speak truth. Because having an income, uh, his income is based on that. Uh, so if his income is based upon that, it would, um, what do you call it? It would affect his truth speaking. Again, this is a, a sly dig at ulama who get wages for the teaching, mm -hmm. right? So uh, because of that, um, uh, this is the whole part of the whole, the, 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 the appeal of it is that I don't take money, they do. Mm. So it kind of puts that distrust Amongst the people mm -hmm. Just to clarify We don't get paid For the podcast <laughs> yeah. Alright So we're speaking truth here But we should right? <laughs> We don't get paid For the podcast So therefore uh, We're not issues here So our enemy point Number four uh, Is that um, Number five uh, The fifth enemy point he goes, I say He goes He claims all madhahib Including the Malikis and Shias They were of the view, position Of four Rafi Udains in Salah Right First Going to Ruku Coming Ruku And coming up from The second Raka'at They all That's nonsense <laughs> That's nonsense. Firstly, there's an ikhtilaf in the Maliki Madhab itself, yeah. where the Mudawwana says contrary, which he accepts as authority, mm -hmm. by the way. What's the Mudawwana view of the Maliki Madhab? So there's ikhtilaf in the Maliki Madhab. And what is the Shafi view or the Shafi say regarding the fourth raf that you talk about? Mm -hmm. There is no consensus. He claims all on one side, Ahlul Kufa. That's not true. Mm. That's not true at all. Right? The raf that you mentioned, yes, you may say so, but the Maliki Madhab clearly has an ikhtilaf on this. Mm. Right? The Mudawwana says contrary, which I think everyone knows the Maliki Madhab. Mudawwana is one of the first texts you look at in terms of authority. And there's a khilaf within the Maliki Madhab. So the idea there's a consensus and even on the four raf, there's no consensus. That's fifth enemy point is historically inaccurate. Right? Again, if you were to refer to Arabic books, it wouldn't take you too long to find that. Yeah. Right? You don't have to do too much research. Uh, no worries. Number six, sixth enemy point. Uh, if you don't listen to what enemy point, like I said, this is how he speaks. Yeah. Right? I will never speak like this. This is not enemy point. When, when you say enemy point, I'm expecting, you know, a lengthy tahriq behind yeah, yeah. it or whatever. There's but not, this is, is the enemy point. <laughs> this is how it is, right? It's hard because there's not much to go off, yeah. right? Uh, number six, he claims that the, uh, this is his claim. He goes, and he says it over and over again. He claims the first hadith to be found in all books of hadith, the first hadith to be found in all books of hadith in the chapter of Salah is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar about doing the four of your days. So if you go to Kitab al-Salah, of all hadith books, please go back and watch this video. I, I listened to it three, four times just to make sure that he said this, right? In all hadith books, the first hadith in Kitab al-Salah is Abdullah ibn Umar about doing Rafi Adain. Right? Everyone has access to at least the six books of hadith online. Please go to Kitab al-Salah, go to the first hadith, and tell me if all hadith books, they have this. 
which shows me that he heard this point somewhere yeah. and he said it. He didn't actually open the hadith book up himself and read it. Yeah. If he had done that, he would have found it. <laughs> right? That's the sixth uh, ilmi point. Oh, the seventh cool. ilmi point. Um, uh, let's go through. Okay, that's a similar. The fourth rough is no unanimity of it. Claims of such from the hadith of Ibn Umar are strange to say the least. Okay, he. Okay, number eight. He weakens the hadith of Abdul Mas'ud. So anyone that knows about the position of Ahlul Kufa, he talks mm -hmm. about Ahlul Kufa, right? Which, by the way, when we say Ahlul Kufa, that's not just Abu Hanifa, Abu Yusuf, and Imam Muhammad. Mm. Right, we're talking about the Nakhais, the Sufyan al mm -hmm. right? Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash, mm -hmm. these great Imams, they're of this view. Mm -hmm. So, when you say just the Ahlul Kufa, suggesting that Abu Hanifa, no, there's the Imams of Ahlul Kufa that have held this view. Mm -hmm. So, straight away, if you're a person that <laughs> just doesn't know it much, we say, okay, wait, are, we tell, are you telling me that in the first century and the early second century, at least, the scholars of the Kufa were not doing Rafa Yudain? Surely that's the thing to think about. Yeah. Because we're talking about salah that everyone sees. Yeah. It's not like a a um, a concealed masala about wiratha or something that someone may have missed something. We're talking about salah what you see. So we're going right back by his own admission, first century, second century, early second century kufa, they would not perform rafi except for the first takbir. Surely there is something to think about here. Mm -hmm. And that's what Alama Kashmiri mentions. If he had read this book, he would have realized that he goes that that point itself shows that the, er the inherited practice in Kufa was to not do Rafi Yadayn. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Where did that originate from? It has to come from the Sahaba, mm -hmm. uh, Abdul Mas'ud. So if you don't accept the hadith, right? He goes that itself is a impl implication. So a person should straight away humble themselves and say, okay, I want to do Rafi no problem. But to kind of condemn it the way he does is completely unjustified. But anyway. That can put that seventh ilmi point there. The eighth ilmi point, he weakens Abdul Mas'ud's hadith where he says, Ala usallikum, shall I not pray to you the way I saw Mesh Allah pray? And you only done first one takbir. Mm -hmm. uh, one rafi then in the first takbir. So, <laughs> again, this is ignorance to a, a high degree. The reason being is because, number one, this hadith of Abdul Mas'ud um, has even been authenticated by imams that he takes. Mm -hmm. Right? So when he grades hadith, he looks at <coughs> Sheikh Albani, Sheikh Zubar Zay. What does Sheikh Albani say about this hadith? He says the following. He narrates the hadith. He says, um, uh, Ibn Sa'ud said, Ala usalli lakum salat al Rasulullah sallam qala alqama. The student says, Fasalla, Ibn Sa'ud prayed, Falam yarfa yaday illa awwala marra. He didn't raise his hand except in the beginning, first time. This is mentioned Muslim Ahmed, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, Nasai, Tahawi, Bayhaqi, etc. Sheikh Albani does this, right? He does the khreej of it. And then he says, Wa hadha sanadun sahihun. This is an authentic sanad, Rijalu Rijal Muslim. Mm -hmm. Right? Waqad Hassan Tirim was Sahaw ibn Hazm. Mm -hmm. Ibn Hazm was authenticated. Wakhala from Akharun, Fadafu. Others opposed him and weakened him. Mm -hmm. The likes of Abdul Mubarak, Dar Qutni, Ibn Hibbana, others. Walhaku Annahu Sahihun Thabit. What is correct, this is Sahih, it is established from Abdul Mas'ud. Mm -hmm. right? That's Sheikh Albani's view. So just to be highlight here, you're not, uh, why I'm saying this is not, doesn't be, uh, these arguments are not. Definitive. If you want to talk about Rafi Yudain, we can discuss that as a separate point. That's not, we're not interested in that. The point is that you're trying to present this as a deviancy of the ulama. Yeah. It's these Hanafis that have deceived you. This is Albani, mm -hmm. who himself then goes on to say that, um, It's strange. Mm -hmm. It's istighrab, right? It's strange in Mas'ud that he would do such a thing, that he's unaware of Rafi Yudain. That's mm -hmm. what Sheikh Albani is saying. So again, the idea that this is the Hanafis doing this, these are non-Hanafi scholars. Mm. Number two, uh, to kind of con uh, continue with this hadith point about his uh, ignorance of it, is that he takes an argument from a guy called Sheikh Zubair Zay. I mentioned him before, right? We have this very peculiar views regarding the Dalits. Uh, if you had time, we'll go into this more, right? But I'm going to try to briefly mention this as much as possible. Is that he has this point about um, the Dalits that uh, the Dalits basically refers to that uh, if a narrator is known for concealing narrators, so when I'm narrating for someone, I say an fulan from so and so, and I conceal narrators, mm -hmm. the person is called a mudallis. Mm -hmm. If someone does the least, then as you know, um, you have to make sure that you've um, what is called tasrib is sama that they have actually heard the narration. So they say, I heard this, then yes. it's fine. Yeah. When they say something vague, then you can't take it. Yeah. So the Senate has Sufyan authority in it. Mm -hmm. Now, all the other muhadithun, like Imam Bukhari, Ibn Hibban, that tried to weaken it, Daru Khutni, they did it via a root of illa. So they either said because the word uh, once is not mentioned in some narrations, uh, or uh, there's actually another version of the hadith, which is what Imam Bukhari says is more authentic. What none of them said, and they were responded to, or the academic responded to, what none of them said was that Sufyan al-Thawri was a mudallis 
and he's an ana ana, so he's duif. That's not what they said about this hadith. <laughs> His sole argument about weakening the hadith, right? Main argument, sorry, is that Sufya thought he's a mudallis, he's an ana ana. So the one thing that they never mentioned. One thing that the well, uh, never mentioned. He mentioned that, and the reason why my theory, which I'm pretty sure is true, is because he didn't understand the other reasons. <laughs> the other reasons were ilal. Yeah. Ilal are difficult to understand. You have to go back to the books of ilal, right? So there you have to kind of back and forth, right? This is easy. If I say to you, it's a mudallis. And Anas, so then he says to his students or people that are there, mm-hmm. he goes, go and ask anyone to find this hadith with the bi sama from Sufyan al Thawri. Right? That's his uh, point that he mentions, right? So again, no one earlier has ever mentioned this. And the reason being is because Sufyan al Thawri, according to Imam Bukhari himself, was qalilu tadlis. He done very little tadlis and mm-hmm. tadlis was accepted. Mm-hmm. There's also a great tafsil of tadlis. Mm-hmm. That's the problem, these people don't read. But if you've got to go down the route that these early imams are called mudallis, so therefore you have to have tasrib is sama. Uh, Sheikh Hatim's uh, master dissertation on the top, topic of tadlis. He's got a lengthy section where he talks about why each imam, like A'mash, Hassan al Basri, um, Qatada, uh, Sufyan al Thawri, Sufyan al Ayyina, that we include tadlis. One has to look into their uh, narrations to see when that tadlis came out. It's not this simple rule, which he calls a pet rule, that mudallis, tasrib is sama, therefore is da'if. <laughs> Right? That's not how it works. Yeah. Again, I don't have time to go through it. Maybe in a future episode when I review uh, the Shara Muqidah of Sheikh Hatim, I'll discuss this in more detail. But just to know for now, <laughs> more reading, but it's nonsense. Absolute nonsense what he's talking here. Because um, this goes against what Imam Bukhari himself did. Now he's aware, because in some of the writings, they mentioned that Imam Bukhari mentioned from, from Raisman Sufyan al with An mm. in Sahih Bukhari. So he goes, no, that's different. In Sahih Bukhari, An will accept it because there's assumed Tasrib al-Sama in there somewhere. Imam right? Bukhari must have known. Imam, Imam Bukhari must have known, right? Which is fine, yeah. no problem, right? That's not a problem. But then he claims that, ninth enemy point, and we're going to go 10, don't right? Ninth <laughs> enemy point, he claims that there are only 10 ana ana hadith of Sufyan authority in Sahih Bukhari. There's only 10, mention this, 10 okay. ana ana hadith of Sufyan authority in uh, Bukhari. You know, if it turned out to be, you know, 15 or 20 or 30, fair enough, not too long. But if I was to tell you that the number of Anna Hadith of Sufyan Thawri in Sahih Bukhari is 255, <laughs> right? If I tell you it's 255, that's not, you know, and if you're asking whose counting is this, <laughs> if uh, you refer back to the book by, it's called Al Mudallisun Fi Sahih Bukhari by uh, Dr. Khalid, uh, it's a popular book uh, of, um, uh, where he kind of goes for the Mudallisun, he counts them. And it is 255 Anna Hadith of Sufyan Thawri in Sahih Bukhari, a slight. Increase from the 10 that he claims Again, why am I saying this? Because he's not reading through it That's why I think he was close Times it by 10 <laughs> Take away Times it by 9 Whatever it works out to be, right? But the reason why is because The whole reason I'm trying to tell the people here Is that he's not reading the sources Yeah, yeah. He's not reading the sources So therefore the, there is Absolute ignorance And last uh, enemy point Inshallah um, Which is quite funny Again, these are a bit more complicated ones uh, Some people might just struggle to understand Is that um, There's a hadith uh, of uh, Sorry, it's a hadith of Um Malik ibn Huwaydith mm-hmm. in Sunan Nasa'i where he claimed that um, the Messiah Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did Rafa'udain between the two sajdas. Mm-hmm. Now again, um, the hadith has been weakened by some ulama and some authenticated it. Those who weakened it said that the Malik ibn Huwaydith narration is um, weak because of the fact that uh, it goes against what? We know from Malik's narration in Hawarith where there is no rough between the two sajdas. Mm-hmm. Others say, no, this is rough between two sajdas, it was abrogated. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's a famous khilaf, the son of the Sahih. What he does is, following his teachers, where he's there, again, not going to original sources, he says, no, the reason why this hadith is da'if is because Qatada is in it and he's a mudallis. He loves this tadlis thing, mm-hmm. right? He's a mudallis and he says, an. Mm-hmm. Again, the Qatada discussion of tadlis has been discussed in great detail, mm-hmm. completely unaware of the discussion, absolute ignorance of the topic. With confidence again, confidence again, right? And even in the uh, the, the this video, this is the first full video I've kind of tried. No, sorry, it's the first video I tried to watch completely. I couldn't get through it, right? But he's kind of giving examples of like this is like how uh, Abu Jahl couldn't recognize Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in contrast to the Muslim Sahabu couldn't recognize him. Like you know, this is how Baatil and Haq is like he's giving comparison to Mushrikeen how they would twist the nusus the way these Hanifs are twisting the nusus. That's the comparison he's making throughout the video. So again, uh, uh, so you can imagine the, 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 the audience how they reacted to this, right? But what the problem here is that the Qatada narration of this Malik and Hawarith narration, if you're saying he's a mudallis, therefore he's da'if, right? So therefore the two sajda Rafi is wrong, the same hadith without the two sajda, the same sajda of Qatada is in Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim has the same Qatada narration that goes from Malik ibn Hawarith about Rafi Udain. 
So if he's da'if in Sunan Nasa'i, he's da'if in Sahih Muslim. Muslim. In Sahih Muslim, if he's fine, that means he's authentic in Sunan Sun Nasa'i. Right? Then you can maybe argue and say someone else made a mistake, but qadadat at least. But why is he going through that? That's the most easiest one to find. Uh, understand for <laughs> yeah. him. Right? The ilal part is too much. It's too much. <laughs> right? Ilal is too complicated, right? To say that there's shad and uh, if you compare the narrations and you look at the sanad and maybe this person made a mistake, that's too complicated. <laughs> right? This is simple. Mudallis, al Tasib al Sama, and the confident level. He claims, not in this video, another clip or so of his, right? He claimed that he goes, any hadith in which there is a uh, mudallis as the least, I can tell you where Tasrib al Sama is. Right? I'm, I'm pretty sure most of the Kibar Hufad couldn't do that. <laughs> right? I just give you a random hadith and you'll tell you which book it is. The guy can't narrate the hadith books himself, right? That he's doing his five year research on, and you're telling me he's doing. From memory, yeah, that's right? Impossible. It's the it's the it's the crowd that you're duping. So it's quite a, uh, it's a sorry state. Yeah. And these are examples. So if you want to respond, right, I'm happy to respond to all of these mm -hmm. specifics, right? The mm -hmm. points I mentioned. Please do take me up on this, right? He mentions the last. It should be a length in point, right? It's the last point. Sorry. He quotes Imam Bukhari, right? He quotes Imam Bukhari. Now Imam Bukhari it comes back to our original point that you mentioned earlier on. Imam Bukhari has very harsh language in the Juz Rafi Yadain. Yeah. Right, about those who do, those who don't do Rafi Adain. And he quotes it. He's like, look, right, even though his student Tirmidhi mentions that the Rafi Adain was not done by some of the Sahaba, Tabi'un, mm -hmm. uh, Sufyan al Thawri, etc., they didn't do Rafi Adain. Al-Kufa didn't do Rafi Adain. So for Tirmidhi, he's saying there's a valid position, but Imam Bukhari is very harsh. So therefore, as I mentioned, you can take the views of the scholars like this if you have the same capacity as those scholars, mm -hmm. right? But what if I was to say to you, if you want to go down this route, you can go down that route, no problem. In Sharmani Athar, Imam Tahawi quotes from Sahih Sunnah back to Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash. Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash is from the Rijal of Bukhari. Mm -hmm. He comes before Bukhari. And Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash says, Ma I have not seen a faqih who does Rafi Udain except in the first takbir. Mm -hmm. Right? So now, if I was to use that and say, uh, Shafi is not a faqih. Mm. Right, Zuhri is not a faqih mm. Salim is not a faqih Right Abu Bakr Iyash is an imam Thiqa Rijal Bukhari mm -hmm. Before Bukhari You would turn around and say That's Abu Bakr Iyash's view He got Maybe he was too passionate Maybe he, he felt yeah. emotional about it And I'll be I'll be like That's fair So if Abu Bakr Iyash does it It's not allowed for me to quote If Bukhari does it It becomes allowed for you to quote Yeah Right This is not a fair distribution So if you're going to try to come to uh, You want to argue And that's why One of the popular things about uh, Injil Ali Mirza is that he would not discuss someone face to face because uh, with an alim he would discuss with um, journalists and those kind of people but with an alim he won't why because an alim would say uh, what's your view regarding uh, Alama Kashmiri's risala on the topic mm. right he wouldn't know he hasn't read it mm. right oh sorry can you please read this to me and tell me what it means he can't do that with an alim that's what's going to happen with a journalist they won't know what to ask <laughs> they will take it so amongst the Pakistan scene they kind of treat him as like an alim He's not an alim by any standard. The reason being is because <laughs> when we call someone ignorant, what we mean by ignorance is that not that they don't know anything. Ignorance means that the topic you're trying to discuss, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So for example, if I'm competent in a field, but now on the podcast, I discuss, we say, no, next part I want to talk about physics. Yeah. So now you say you're ignorant yeah. talking about physics. That would be an accurate statement, even though I may have knowledge of other fields. So we're now calling him ignorant. There could be, he may know more of hadith in Bukhari than the average imam, but the average imam is not trying to take on the whole madhab, <laughs> madhahib. Yeah. Right? He's not taking on Abu Hanifa. He's not taking on Malik. Because you're taking them on, therefore we say, by that standard, you're absolutely ignorant. Yeah. Um, the, inshallah, when the article comes out with the podcast, you can read it for yourself. Just see what he says, see the references, and tell me where I got it wrong. If there's other questions people want to ask, you can put it in the, join the Telegram channel, inshallah, you can put it in the, uh, notes and I'll respond to it or if there's more questions we can take them on specific points about Sahaba inshallah if you want to because uh, we're going to do a, a separate podcast on Sahaba mm -hmm. how to do with the issue of Sahaba is very important Yeah, and I don't want to do it in like what he's saying I want to go for, for the academic works on yeah. the issue uh, but that's another topic inshallah I think just to wrap okay. up here now as well um, I mean my reaction to this uh, as someone coming in um, and just hearing this is uh, the the first the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, especially when discussing this type of person, is the concept of jahlul murakab, someone who doesn't know, but doesn't know that he doesn't know, and therefore argues on a basis of ignorance, and that's. I, I would contend. I think he does know now. <laughs> I'm not joking. I think he does know now because 
when you become so popular, how can you not be aware of the following arguments? That's true. So I think there is an awareness now. So there's a reluctance to engage mm. with people because of that. But yeah, it does start off as Jahan yeah. But I think when you start, you think it's easy. I know this. Yeah, yeah. When you start hearing this stuff, then it gets a bit complicated. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of people, uh, it should serve as a lesson. His case, as a case that he should serve as a lesson, as we've done it now, mm. for others who are thinking about going into the public scene and want to uh, have an idea about the ulama or have an idea about ilm and Islam, that they should just be careful before putting themselves out there on a public platform and embarrassing themselves. Because at one point in a stage, someone will come and completely remove your credibility and you'll be disgraced for eternity, uh, for eternity to come. Because after it's been known that you are ignorant about a certain topic or many topics uh, for that matter, your your whole standing becomes dubious. Yeah, and, and also I'll say that there's no people have this fear. There's a temporary fear, mm -hmm. but the reason why I don't think it's uh, is something to be afraid of. That's why I don't really care, like sit, discuss with students. Because when I teach, I try to teach you skills, mm -hmm. not teach you facts. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. But if I, like I said, the beginning example, if I taught you about, uh, so I said, Sufi Thor is a modellist, he's an anana. Uh, and you went and used that, it will win most arguments. Mm -hmm. But if I taught you, I said, oh, here's the books of the least. Here are the imams. And I teach you that. I teach you Arabic language. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that when I, you as my student now, you go and find out and say, Ustad, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. because, his, because his level is not that, you're not going to have students that know Arabic. So therefore, these are movements which are following a charismatic figure. Yes. When the charismatic figure dies or goes or finishes, the movement withers away. Yes. Because there's no depth of it. Whereas the, when we teach people, if I die or when I die, right, and I've taught people, then I've uh, brought people forth into the field of the field of knowledge that can engage in the science itself. That's what the madhabs did. That's, what the, that's the idea of a madhab. It's not just facts, you know, because that only works because you have superficial knowledge then. Yeah. And you can win arguments, but when I'm dead and you don't have the same charisma as me or as the person that you're looking at, let's say, this guy, this guy, the movement finishes with him. So mm. when people say, are we worried or should we be worried? Yeah, there's a temporary issue where you're going to have people that are following there, but this is not a movement of in. Mm. It's a populist movement. It's a populist movement. So when you have like uh, some of these Salafi mashaykh that had in, they have students that have in. Mm. They have students that engage in, but then those students will disagree with their sheikh as well because they have the ability to do so. Yeah. And then therefore you have a bit more of like, then it ends up becoming like a madhab yeah. itself. And then the quality of the madhab kind of shines through or not. Here there's none, none of that fair. Mm. There's no one there that can write Arabic. There's no one there that can read Arabic. There's no one there that can study these topics. So, and if there were, they'll be disagreeing with him straight away because they will know his mistakes. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think it's uh, pertinent to end there. Inshallah. It's good to end there, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan for the enemy points. Thank you. Much, appre <laughs> much appreciate. Just to be clear, this is the easiest critique ever, <laughs> right? Because it does not require much effort. Very deep. But uh, I would say is that there's much more, mm. much more to be said mm. uh, because of lack of time. We can't, uh, but please do read the article when it comes out. Um, there I've not mentioned like uh, general remarks, it's just facts. This mm -hmm. is what he said, this is a response, this is what he said, this is a response. If you want to respond to it, you're more than welcome to respond to it. Khair, inshallah. And with that, we will end inshallah. Please do leave a comment, like and subscribe. Do share the video with uh, all the Pakistani friends that you have and family members. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.